Bigger than that case. Give me some silence. Yeah. Hello, welcome to Bigger Than Capes. I'm Zach, and this week I'm joined by Angela. How are you doing, Angela? Good. Um, I, I was okay until I got to the subject matter of today's podcast. Yeah, so this is... Um, all right, so as a precursor, our whole thing is that we do indie comics and we do independent stuff. However, we started a horrible tradition of discussing the Fantastic Four films, yes. which we have to see to its conclusion. I think we're like bound to that now yeah. as a as a fact. Yeah. So back in January, we discussed Rise of the Silver Surfer. Yeah. And we had a pretty bad time, I think is well, wasn't great, was it? <laughs> However, this week, we're back to discuss 2015's Fantastic Four, Fan Four Stick, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, now, we try to stay quite positive and err on the side of, you know, positivity. I don't know what I'm yeah. trying to say there. We, um, we, we weren't too, we weren't overly harsh with our criticisms in some ways. <laughs> Um, Apart from bears and teeth and, you know, yeah, that sort of thing. But this is this is a different a different animal altogether, I think. This um so first question I was gonna ask you before you rewatched this a couple of days ago, what did you remember about this and what was what were your like reactions when you saw this the first time i, I went to the cinema i know yeah i'm the I only did. one i feel like i think there were six of us in the entire screening and four of us were there together so <laughs> yeah i i went and saw it i remember it being very dark mm. both in 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 literally like the cinematography <laughs> was terribly dark i remember being completely confused by some scenes because i couldn't really see what was going on yes um i remember coming out feeling ridiculously disappointed the most disappointed i've ever been in any film i think and i've seen some terrible films um, oh yeah of course but this was uselessly disappointing i remembered reed being terrible um I had forgotten at the time I was disappointed by the amount of Ben Grimm we got, the thing mm. we got and his pants, but we'll get onto that. Um, yes. I remember being disappointed by Sue Storm and going, how many times did her hair change from real to wig? Um, and that was, and I was like, and the internet's going crazy over the fact there's a black Johnny Storm that's the least of this film's problems guys that's not even a problem <laughs> yeah i think so okay in order of what you've just said um it's got that dc comics everything the contrast has been turned like way up so everything's super dark yeah um and then there's been like a blue fil filter like a blue filter chucked over the whole thing like a blue green filler so everything looks kind of weird and alien and Boy, is that annoying to look back on. Isn't it? Because it, yeah. it, I know it was like a stylistic choice in stuff like the Batman films and... Um, Man of Steel is a bit Man of Steel out. is definitely... Um, but seeing it now, because I've not, I've not rewatched Man of Steel and I've not really gone back to... I know it's in some Batman scenes. I've not gone back to Batman in a while and I've not... Yeah, I guess I've just... I'd gotten over it like everybody yeah. else. So going back to it now... Ooh, that's that's kind of a bummer. I think it sets a whole kind of, although it's very much normally our thing, there's a layer of sadness over this purely by like lighting choices, yeah. um, or lack, or, lack of or, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or coloring choices afterwards. Um, in terms of the cast, it, it's it's kind of infuriating because I I like all of this cast. Yeah, I think, I think they're all really good actors. I think 
Miles Teller is, is a really good actor, but seeing him yeah. as Reed, it's like they've cut around all the scenes where he's good to leave what's left. Yeah. But that's true of everybody. I think every actor in this seemingly isn't in it enough. <laughs> no. I mean, like Kate Mara, for example, you can tell that she did not have a good time on this film just because I know she's better than what we got. Yeah, the the same with Michael B. Jordan, James. Is it the same with everybody? Everybody yeah. in this is like a good actor having a bad time. Yeah. And seemingly very little screen time, despite the fact that I can see them all the damn time. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> How do you yeah. do that? How do you show me, like, Kate Mara for, like, an hour and a half, and it feels like she's barely in this film? I, I don't get yeah. it. Yeah. Um, it's weird. And also, when I watched it at the time, I went, have I just seen Chronicle, the sequel? Oh. <laughs> uh... I'm I'm in a minority. I don't particularly like Chronicle. Um, I think mainly because male characters suck, but that's another story. They do in that film, let's be honest. Um, so yeah, I was just yeah, but like you say, like I I like all those actors. I've seen them in other things. Thank God they've managed to have careers since. Um, but in that, like you say, it's like oh. Miles Teller was in this, was he? I don't really remember much of him. <laughs> I I feel like every person who's in this film probably doesn't like to talk about it. Yeah, I think it's one of those, like, if you go to one of these press things for any project that they're doing or you get an interview, the handler will say, look, you can ask about anything, but not that Fantastic Four film. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Whilst I think, right, there's a certain charm to a lot of awkward comic book films. As it's well known, I, I'm a Joel Schumacher Batman guy. Yeah. I, I, I'll never have a bad time with Batman Forever or Batman and Robin. But the idea that people seem to have more of a problem with George Clooney as Batman when this happened. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't get it. And um, I mean, Joel Schumacher's Batman films do actually hark back to the campiness of the Adam West yeah. interpretation. So it's not completely out there. This, I don't know. I don't know what they were going for. I genuinely don't know. It well, feels like no one knew. The thing is, this is... Cl- okay, so... We should probably start getting into actually talking about the we film. We should, so we'll yeah. Um, so the, the the film is clearly inspired by the Ultimate Fantastic Four yeah. comics, which kind of show us a younger version of the four coming together. In basically this scenario, Reed starts to develop a teleporter to the negative zone, and Ben is his friend and Sue and Johnny come in and they all meet at the Baxter building. Everything's great. And that's basically what we get here. Kind of. Worse. Yeah. Cause this is the thing. I, I started reading ultimate fantastic Four. what, whenever it started, I remember getting those big English oh, editions that were the slightly big too ones. big. Yeah. Um, and all I remember through reading that was that, it's so inconsistent and like Reed Richards, mm. it's like we're introduced to him and he's 16, but then a few issues later that we get told he's 18 and then he's 21 and then he's 16 again. And we get this whole idea that, you know, he's super intelligent and he skipped years of high school and he's, you know, jumped ahead to university. But then we're basically told, but he's 21 because he's at university. And it's like, yeah, but he's meant to have skipped ahead because he's a genius. God damn it. Um, But I feel all the inconsistencies from the Ultimate series Mm. do definitely inspire this. I think the inconsistencies are the key inspiration, which is real weird. Um, I feel uh, feel many things. I think that's probably part of today's problem. (laughs) So we begin where all great stories begin. Yeah. With a like seven year old, ten year old, maybe 
Reed it, Richards. It's difficult to say because um, the continuity is terrible. I can tell you that the year is 2007. However, yeah, 2007, this film opens. Um, make of that what you will. That makes sense, um, actually. No, it not make, in a, well, I say that. It doesn't make any sense, but it makes it sense. It doesn't make in terms any of sense this film. because bear in mind how, um, how big or small Ben is at this time. He's in the same class as Reed. Mm. If you go later on, spoilers for later in the film, there is a screenshot showing the military's file on the thing that gives Ben's date of birth as the 14th of March, 1986. So, <laughs> right, that's problematic, isn't it? Um, so, which is closer to Jamie Bell's actual age, because um, I believe he was born about 1986. Um, but the fact that little Ben in 2007 is, I mean, at most 10 years old, maybe, let's be generous and say he's maybe 10 years old. Yeah. Um, yeah, so either he's not aged in a decade um or somebody just thought hey you know that really cool bit of the ultimate in that no one actually knows what real age they are let's take that and use it as an actual plot point in this movie double down on it and just really run with it um yeah so yeah that that does not surprise me at all but i so yeah we we see them as like 10 year olds in 2007 yeah and they kind of, they have a careers day and Reed's all like, I'm going to make a teleporter to another dimension. I've built it in my garage and I can send toy cars to some, somewhere else. Yeah. China or the Sahara, I think. I don't know. Um, sand. Yeah. Yeah. Look, the only, only two places on earth with sand, apparently. Um, mental. Um, <laughs> but then... He goes stealing from. Okay, so before he goes stealing from anything, then Homer Simpson, um, yes. who, who is his teacher, the the voice of not not actual. That would be <laughs> that would be completely unfair, actually. If, if yeah, yeah, that would be out of the realm. <laughs> I can't remember the actor's name, but the guy who voices Dan Homer Simpson, Castellanella. That's the I, one. Thank you very you much. Um, who voices Homer Simpson and also voices and portrays the... <laughs> I don't know why I'm describing it like that. Um, throws in a subtle dig about, oh, so you gave up on the flying car. And it's yeah. like, this is one of perhaps five Easter eggs in this entire film. There aren't many. Yeah, and it's like a, a, ca- a casual little reference to the fact that Reed Richards one day will build a flying car, a fantastic car, if you will. Some might say, yeah. And I think we're going to hit every single Easter egg in this film because there's literally less than ten. I, I hazard yeah. to say there is no more than five. I would it's, say, yeah, you can count them on one hand. Yeah. It is so starved for car- for connections to the comic books and the MCU that it's written as if it doesn't care that the target audience is comic book fans. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you need a million Easter eggs to make a good comic book film. You obviously don't. But we've talked about films before that have like more casual references by accident than this has on purpose. Yeah. And I mean, just to bring it back, if you go back to the original and best Fantastic Four film from 2005, there's that moment where Reed morphs his face briefly into Wolverine yes. or Hugh Jackman. So that's a nice little link because, you know, X-Men. And despite the fact that you have Simon Kinberg, who was involved in the X-Men films, involved in this film, not a single hint. You could at least say, you know, I don't know, there's a school somewhere run by Professor Xavier. I don't know. But yeah. the, point, the point is, is there's just no connective tissue to literally anything. Well, when I was reading through the, you know, IMDb trivia on this film, and boy, there's a lot of it. Um, somebody had brought up the, the uh, Josh Trank, I think. That, that's the man who made this film. 
Right. Repeat. Well, no, he made a better version of this film that we will never see. Yes, jo- Josh Trank was the director. He basically has said in the past that this is not the same world as the X Men, which basically I think probably turned a lot of people off because they were probably hoping for this kind of Fox shared universe, and instead they got basically told right be- before the film came out that's not going to happen. Yeah, and. That's that's just one of a, a, a million things that probably got people to not show as much interest in this. Um, so, <laughs> Reed and Ben become friends because Reed tries to steal a power converter yeah. from the Grim scrapyard. Yeah, the the Grim. It, it's a very grim place. Yeah. What one thing I love about this is every time we see the like junkyard if you have subtitles on on netflix the first thing that comes up is indistinct men mumbling (laughs) oh that's excellent (laughs) which is is gloriously perfect for summing up what is going on because it's always just a bunch of guys going like just making noise at each other and you can't see them very well because it's so bloody dark. That's right. Um, At the point where we thought that at one point my mum was like, is that a power converter or a hot water tank? Like, very hard to tell. It's, <laughs> you just can't tell what it is. But it's the weirdest way to start a friendship. Hey, I stole from your family's scrapyard and that makes us friends now. Yeah, and then we, so, so we then see them in uh, Reed's garage, which incidentally I'm told is the same garage from Back to the Future 2 where Biff keeps his car. That's a nice bit of trivia. Um, that's completely unhelpful trivia, and yet it's the thing on IMDb that interested me the most. <laughs> and to be fair, that bit of trivia is more entertaining than watching that scene in the garage. <laughs> fair. Um, so he basically Reed shows off his teleporter, built of. Really, ninety. This is what gets me. It's built of nineties things. Yeah, it appears to be powered by N sixty fours. Yeah, and despite a computer... the fact that we're in two thousand and seven. Yeah, and the PC is like something that I owned in the early two thousands rather than two thousand seven. It's yeah. it's it's not good. It's like you've just basically. I feel like originally this film was meant to be set in the 90s. Yeah. And that that is why we've got the Ben Grimm date. And then they decided, no, we'll make them teenagers in the modern day. Mm-hmm. And that's why we suddenly decided, hey, it's 2007 now. See, yeah, it's, it's difficult because it's either that or my other theory was like, are you trying to tell us that, like, you know reads this poor inventor kid and he's you know having to use whatever he can find so it's all old and busted up and then all i could think was where do you get 10 n64s in 2007 if you have no money or resources because i i wouldn't even know where to source a working n64 now (laughs) no no i mean i would think that they are with nostalgia being what it is, I would think trying to get hold of one that works is nigh on impossible because there'll be big collector's items because people who grew up with them, now it's like, oh, God, do you remember N64s? <laughs> Weren't they the greatest? And yeah. Were, and but yeah, <laughs> nostalgia. Um, that, so, yeah, I, th- there's different ways to read it. There are so many things in this where there's different ways to read it. Like... Why are these... Right, we've been told so much that that Ben Grimm is from Yancey Street. Yeah. In New York City. So why are they on some random town in the middle of nowhere as if they've they've never really been to New York? It's weirdly dedicated to not referencing Fantastic Four material to the point where it, it begs the question... Is this meant to be a Fantastic Four film? <laughs> um, but this is where the first irritation, real irritation, strikes me when 
Reed is trying to screw together some the like wire connections, I, I guess, from his power yeah. converter. And Ben's like, you're stripping the screw. Here, use this. And gives him the screwdriver from a Swiss Army knife. And it's like, sorry, <laughs> are you telling yeah. me that Reed has built all of this, wiring and all, and he doesn't even have a screwdriver to do the damn thing? Yeah. And so what? Every screw he's used is just broken yeah. now. He can never unscrew anything. I just... What the hell is this? Um, I, f- I feel like they thought we need a way for these two to bond because we've set them up completely. The fact that you've actually got a perfect setup for them to bond in that for some reason you've dropped massive abusive tri- childhood with Ben. You've got, you know, his brother beats him up. And then you've got hints that, you know, Reed's stepfather's a bit of a dick. Mm. And it's like you have the perfect setup there for two children to bond uh, because their families suck. But no, you've decided we need a way for them to bond. Let Ben lend him a screwdriver, even though that goes against every single reason that makes sense because he's already built the thing and it's literally one screw he has to put in. But mysteriously, he doesn't. Maybe the screwdriver ran out of screwdrivering ability oh true that does happen a lot actually <laughs> because, yeah you know because he's done all that screwing and he's done so much screwing he's broken his screwdriver but it is ridiculous but it just makes me so <clears throat> mad because you have perfect set up for bonding right there and that they both come from screwed up family backgrounds we're not gonna we're not gonna use that <laughs> screwdrivers um no very, it's very true and th- there's there is so much we can get into that doesn't add up about Ben being beat up by his brother and his brother being all like, ah, it's clobbering time. And then is that really what you'd shout in battle later, Ben? Is it, is it mate? Is it? Yeah. Um, it just feels like <laughs> childhood trauma. <laughs> I, yeah. I just, I don't get it. And then what I don't get as well, this, this, this goddamn Swiss army knife, then later when we see Reed move into the Baxter building, yeah. Ben gifts it him like, hey, remember that time I helped you? You yeah. know, and, the thing? and for the rest of the film, I'm kind of thinking, well, that's going to matter, isn't it? He'll he'll escape yeah. because he's got the Swiss Army knife. He'll yeah. he'll stab Doom with the Swiss Army knife to, you know, oh, yeah. the Swiss Army knife has to. No, we don't no. see the Swiss Army knife after it's given to Reed. And it's like, it. so there's no sentimental value placed on this. There's no like, oh, man. Yeah, God, you've been there for me for all these years. There's no, there's nothing. There's zip. It's like, it's just a thing that happens with no consequence or reason. It's, it's Chekhov's Swiss Army knife. If it's a, it's a MacGuffin that doesn't even function as a MacGuffin. It's yeah. the problem. I, I don't know. I, uh, it, it shouldn't annoy me, and yet it deeply does. Mm. However, we, we've got bigger questions, Angela. <laughs> so many questions. Why is it so easy to knock out all the power in America mm. or yeah. in every film? And I have to assume that's based on true events because I've, I've never hung out in the suburbs of America, but I'm yeah. basically led to believe that anything from turning on a blender to ripping a hole in space and time <laughs> can basically turn off the power for like an entire town. I'm assuming that the the power infrastructure in America is terrible. I mean, that's what I assume. <laughs> like, there's no surge protectors. There's no like substate electricity substations. There's there's just nothing there in the network that that you know it, the infrastructure just wasn't thought about. They're just like, you know what, electricity, yeah. And then they didn't actually think about how to manage the electricity. Um, I mean, it makes a good case for nationalizing the electricity grid in America because I feel <laughs> that, that might be the only way to stop I, this thing happening. It, it's one of these things where pe- people frequently ask the question of like, hey, what trope do you want to see less of in films? I want to see people demonstrate that something uses a lot of energy without literally turning off a town. That's Yeah. I want a little break from seeing this every time energy is used. <laughs> I mean, I was hopeful because it starts off, it's just like the house and then it's like the street. And I'm like, okay, I can I can buy that. And then it goes to like the next street and then on and on and on. And then like the entire city that we can see, the nameless city, because I don't think it's ever named, is it? 
It is. Is on- it? Only in that we're told it's a 40-minute train ride from the Baxter building. So Reed does mention what it's called. Oyster Bay. It's Oyster Bay. Oyster Bay. So Pretty sure it's Oyster Bay. Oh, that's terrible. Um, as a name and a concept. So, yeah, so then the whole of Oyster Bay just goes dark. All because... Of, and it's like really but also surely if you'd have done that it would have just burnt out all the things in his house and it wouldn't it would have stopped where it wouldn't have worked properly because the power would have burnt out the wires before you know but believe science. me it's it, it, it you know what it's one of the least important bits of nonsense science in this film <laughs> We also, we, it's not even the only blackout in this film. There are at least, <laughs> there's at least another one. Yeah, there is. Um, oh, God. Um, so they teleport this little car. Which doesn't look, when I first saw it, I didn't, in fact, even this time, I didn't realise they'd teleported the car because it just looks like they've turned it to dust. Yeah, the car's not well. And then <laughs> we see that, like, I guess it's meant to be, like, is it seven years later? Yes, it is. Yeah, it I flashes up seven years later, yeah. as if that's yeah. okay. And uh, we're yeah. in a science yeah. fair, and they are clearly adults in their twenties, and they're oh, apparently God. just graduating high school, which is absolutely fine because this is a time on a tradition in Beverly Hills nine zero two one zero to yes, cast people who are not teenagers as teenagers. But the problem is, is it just still feels like elementary school because Homer Simpson is apparently still their teacher and there's small children running around. It's like, were they just held <laughs> back in middle school for like the last seven years? Were they, was that their punishment for blowing up the town's power grid? <laughs> it's really unclear how nothing has changed and yet everything has changed. And basically the exact same projects he was working on seven years earlier... He's still working on seven years later and he's like got the ability for it to die, bring stuff back better, I guess. I don't know. Except yeah. he still destroys the kids like polystyrene plane. I felt so sorry for that little kid. I mean, A, he's in a science fair with grown adults. So he's already yeah, unfair he's advantage. Already, yeah. And then said adults steal his plane and he's like, I'll give it you back. I'll give it you back. And then he, he does. just he does, <laughs> but it's no use to the child now. It's covered in negative zone dust and part of the hey, ones. Hey, hey, hey. Planet sorry. Zero. Planet dust. Zero, sorry. Planet Zero. It's Due not quite for legal negative. reasons. We, we can't, can't call it call negative, it negative zone. zone. Yeah. This is the yeah. thing that I, I remember when Captain Marvel came out and it's like they're using the scrolls, which are Fantastic Fours copyright and it's like spoiler guys nothing is the fantastic four's copyright yeah. it's, it's a miracle he's allowed to be anything related to dr doom and he's just not like all all victor no last name no first name no no last name no title just vic can't can't yeah. be, because it's like we can't call it the negative zone it's planet zero and it's like what are you talking about it's the negative zone we know yeah. it's the negative zone don't don't give us like the one glimmer of possibility and then go nah it's it's like any possibility that this was going to tie into a greater cosmic idea is in the fact that it has to be the negative zone if you then strip Mm -hmm. that and it's like planet zero quote unquote yes planet zero could be anything anywhere that could literally it it's nonsensical it's like what sounds comic booky (gasps) Planet Zero, we shall call it that. I mean, you could have even called it Dimension Zero or something like yeah. that. But, I mean, that would have been slightly better. Or, you know, the Zero Zone. I mean, you know. No, I'm, not, I'm not sure that sounds as great as we no, want. But. <laughs> no, but Planet Zero is like the least exciting thing it, you could possibly have chosen to call it. It's the most like 1970s B-movie yeah. sci-fi name. And while I'm normally all for that, it does annoy me when you're sat there and you're like, come on, say negative zone, give us the yeah. payer, give us what we're here for. No. 
Uh, Reed, the super genius, doesn't even realise he's teleporting stuff to a different dimension, let's be honest. No, because, like, Sue has to come up and, it, you know, here's a vial of extra-dimensional dirt that I keep on my person for reasons. I mean, you know, fair, we all do. (laughs) And she's like, look, and it looks exactly the same, and somehow a pretty girl with a vial of dirt telling him it's from another dimension makes Reed rethink that his that maybe it's not just some sand from some random part. Because apparently top scientist Reed never thought to, I don't know, analyse the stuff that came back. <laughs> it's it's a, it's another question on a bed of questions held up on a foundation of questions. <laughs> Yes. Without an answer in sight. I <laughs> what what bothers me even more is that then immediately he joins he joins the Baxter Institute. Is that, that what we're called? The Baxter Institute. Yeah, the Baxter yeah. Institute, yes. Um which is a very it it's the most bizarrely designed building in New York in that it's got the old fashioned bit at the bottom and yeah. then it's got the fancy glass bit at the top and inside it looks like um the set from a 1970s school set drama it's really <laughs> it's like here's a fancy lab but also here are really dark depressing corridors that clearly show that we haven't actually invested in our classrooms or corridors at all yeah. in the last 30 years yes very much so and all right, I I got to get this out there. It, this is this is going to be a run. I'm I'm sorry. The first indication of how little the people making this film give any kind of a shit. And that's that's saying something. Yeah. We're, oh, uh, by the way, we're only like twelve minutes into this film. Yeah, warning. It's... It gets worse. <laughs> but. Reed's strutting along, you know, he's just arrived at the Baxter Institute, and there's, like, a trophy cabinet of all, all the achievements and such. Yeah. Right. And you might know what's coming. I don't know. I don't know if you paused and rewound. I'm not sure. But the first article he he stops to look at that's framed is a picture of a woman. It's facing a newspaper article with a picture of a woman that says, and I quote, Baxter Institute develops first quad series microchip. Yeah. In a pretty little gold frame, it's, and it's mm. it's just yeah. And you're kind of expecting that there'll be references to some other stuff around it. There's nothing, trust me. No. But the next thing he passes is a framed newspaper article. Same yeah. way out, Slight, d- different photographs. There's, a, there's a, a, a dude this time, and like a shot of I don't know technology, blah, just un- yeah. spe- with the headline: Baxter Institute <laughs> develops first quad yeah. series microchip. Microchip, yeah. Literally, same scene, same place, same headline, same fucking newspaper cover, just different pictures. And at that point, 12 minutes in, there's a little part of me that just goes, why would you do this? Why would you care so little that, like, the set dressing is, like... Neither here nor there. And if you just glaze past it and they're all the same newspaper article, like some kind of Scooby-Doo cartoon, that's cool, whatever. But if you show yeah. them both for long enough for me to go, wait, what? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And let's be honest, all comic book fans are us. At, the, at yeah. this point, if we were annoyed by it, everybody who's everybody, spotted it yeah. is annoyed by it. It, yeah, I mean, how hard is it, guys, to mock up a couple of different newspaper article headlines? Real and tough. also, the quad microchip. So, the Baxter Institute, which apparently the main project that's involved is interdimensional travel. But the thing they're known for is a microchip. <laughs> yeah, and I, I can kind of live with this the idea that they've got their, like multitude of projects kicking around i'm okay yeah. with that except for the fact that literally nothing else is mentioned which is also something that bothers me with reed like when we see this yeah. seven year jump and he's literally still got the same prototype and it's like dude you would have rebuilt this you would have improved on this you wouldn't be still running yeah. the same tech that you had seven years earlier if you're a genius also if there was a time to introduce herbie yeah it's, it's either in those seven years where, yeah, maybe he's built himself a little robot friend. Yeah. Or it's in the time we see at the Baxter Institute where it's like, 
there's loads of people doing loads of things here. If somebody had built yeah. Herbie and Reed helps finish it or something, that would work. If yeah. But there's nothing. There is so little to back up the science that it's like the entirety of the Baxter Institute is working on one project, even though it's meant to be kids yeah. from all over the show yeah. doing all kinds of things. Things. You see, that's where the trophy cabinet could have come in handy if you'd have had lots of different things. And hey, maybe it would have been interesting to perhaps have a reference to Victor Von Doom. In an article, yeah. in a trophy cabinet, because he's the guy that starts the project that Reed's also had the same ideas about. Yeah, and it, that's another rant, but it's like <laughs> perfect opportunity for you to mention Victor Von Doom in relation to the Baxter Building or Institute or whatever it is, and you, you miss it. And also, Ben yeah. is apparently only good for hauling luggage. That's the great yes. friendship they have. Ben is the kind of friend who will, you know, carry your suitcase. See, and, and this this plays into another Reed Richards problem. <laughs> we see he he kind of takes the role at the science fair of the scientist who explains the thing whilst Ben does all the flicking of the switches and makes the machine work. And if we had, an, had like a concept here that Ben Grimm was like a mechanic or... And into engineering because he'd grown up in a junkyard and there were cars everywhere. And yeah. some, someone in his family must know how to fix cars, right? Presumably. They must know something about cars. They're everywhere. <laughs> but instead, it's like Ben Grimm, no discernible personality or characteristics. And you can say what you want about the 2005 Fantastic Four, but we know Ben, Johnny, Sue, Reed, we all know they've got credible histories and backgrounds, whether they're um, yeah. bullshit scientists like Reed, um, <laughs> jack of all trades like Sue, who apparently can <laughs> just do whatever job Victor Von Doom chooses, um, yeah. Johnny the pilot, Ben the pilot. It's yeah. We're told enough to understand that these characters belong. Ben Grimm in this version, is just a perpetual hanger-on. He's just... He is, yeah. There. <laughs> and it's like you have the perfect opportunity to bring him in because Ben Grimm, yeah, he's a bruiser. That's his whole That's thing. That's fine, yeah. Time. But also, let's not forget, in various media, including 2005 Fantastic Four, he's a goddamn astronaut. Yeah. He's, you know, he's got skills. You have plenty of way to go, all right, well, we'll bring Reed in, but also his engineering friend who clearly has potential. I mean, let's be honest, Franklin recruits his own son, partly because nepotism, but also, you know, Johnny's sole qualification is, hey, he can build cars. Yes. Johnny is weird because the scenes we see of Johnny being, you know, involved in like street racing and being kind of reckless is the same version of Johnny we're used to. And I'm okay with that. I yeah. think Michael B. Jordan does a good job with ultimately very little. I think we see the Johnny Storm. He could have been, we, we, he, yes. he never gets to be Johnny Storm. And that's, I think if you've got a problem with any of the casting here, it's that every single character doesn't ever get to show you who they are or what yeah. they're portraying. Like, Michael B. Jordan could have read every Fantastic Four comic before this. Mm. It doesn't show if he has been allowed to, like, think about what the character is or learn the role or prepare or anything because he barely gets to be Johnny before he's the torch just like kate mara miles teller and jamie bell they all barely get yeah. the chance to show you the individuals before they're cursed with powers which then the film stops happening yeah. so there's no yeah. time for anyone to like yeah the only person we see any character building for is reed and spoiler reed richards sucks i so hard. like and what's annoying is he doesn't even seem like he sucks for any reason other than the fact that it's like, no, no, he, he don't never, never mind. Ignore that. He sucks for a very for specific reason that we'll get he to in a minute. He sucks for lots of reasons that we'll yeah. get to. Um, yeah. Back to, back to the Baxter Institute and so, the double headlines. Uh, 
So after the double headlines, we see him kind of hanging out, getting to grips with the place. He's in the library. He sees... Oh, can I, can I just say, that library scene, that was one of the worst scenes. Because it's... there is no chemistry. No. There is no attempt to write them as real people. No. And also, the only reason we're doing it is so we can put in a Captain Nemo reference for later. Yes. Um, so we... we... We have this interaction where Reed sees Sue sat at the table and he's like, hey, I know you. We met that one time. Yay. You showed me some dirt. Yeah, yeah you, the, the dirt girl. Sweet. Um, and they sit down and it could not be more clear that like Sue wants to be left alone. She wants no part of this conversation with Reed. Yeah. He's just some random guy she's met once and here, here he is, and that's okay. But she doesn't really care, and that's fu- that. That makes a lot of sense. How many? T- I, I meet plenty of people that I think. Yeah. Oh yeah, I've met you once. I'd think it was weird if you came over and started talking yeah. to me about Jules Verne. I mean, it, <laughs> it reads very much. I mean, I don't know if anyone saw, but there was recently a TikTok that went viral about a young woman who was hit on a very a creepy older dude hit on her while she was on a live stream, and frankly. I was getting those vibes. I'm like, look, read the room, read. Sue is basically trying to let you down so you don't yell at her. She's basically doing that thing that all women have done at some point, which is this dude's creeping me out, but I don't know how to get myself out of this situation without making it worse. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, yeah, I'm going to interact with you on a very basic level and hope to God that you just leave me the hell alone. And that yes. I'm afraid for Sue. I mean, I know that Reed is, you know, incapable of doing anything to her because he's just terrible. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, look, if I saw that happening in a real world situation, I would be going over to Sue and say, are you OK? Is this jerk bothering you? Yeah, because I-, I just feel like it, it creeps me the hell out. I'm like, who signed off on that? We we see too frequently in stuff like this Fantastic Four film that we're meant to be like on the side of the nerdy guy and be like, yeah, the nerdy guy, like, you know, he just wants to talk to the girl. He's yeah. innocent, he's sweet, he's nice. It's like, yeah, but she's clearly uncomfortable in this scene. There's no effort for them to be like an attraction or a friendship. There is nothing here. Yeah. And, and we're what? Whose side do you want us to be on? Because these are meant to be two of our protagonists, but this is super awkward and just feels like exactly as you've described yeah. it. Like, she's just doing a thing. He comes over and he's all like, hey, I'm Reed Richards. I'm amazing. Look at this. Have you read Jules Verne? And she's all like, yeah, fucking obviously I've read Jules mm-hmm. Verne. Yeah, and, just, and- just leave me alone. <laughs> but there's, there's this whole air to it that's like, we're meant to be getting it from like, Reed, who, you know, he's super into all classic nerdy things. He loves Jules Verne and he's all excited about it. And he's meant, it, we're meant to read this as he's legitimately surprised that he's met another human being who's read, <laughs> who's read Jules Verne and knows who Captain Nemo is. And yet, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't read like that. It reads no. as Predator. this is super awkward and maybe leave this girl alone and (laughs) and he doesn't Uh, he doesn't take the hint and also in terms of jules verne books Twenty Thousand leagues under the sea that's the one that you're going for to you know do parallels with the fantastic four because that's an interesting choice (laughs) it's it's interesting isn't it because uh, it feels almost chosen at random in a way yeah, pick me, Jules Verne, he's that dude. They referenced him in Back to the Future. Oh, right, right, because that was a cool film. So we'll reference Jules Verne because nerds like that sort of thing because clearly if it's referenced in Back to the Future, it must be a very well-known thing. Oh, let's just pick a random book. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, they did a television show about that. People watched it back in the 60s. Let's go with that. Perfect. Nerds will love it. it you're entirely right, and it feels like it's a you know coin toss between if they were going to make a Jules Verne reference or a H.G. Wells reference. Hell it, yeah! It feels so disinterested in the ideas that 
it, I, I just feel like it, if you want to reference classic sci-fi, by all means, do it. I, I, I'm never going to, it's you know, begrudge you that. I, I think it, it makes sense. It plays into Reed as a character. But the whole scene is so incredibly awkward that it doesn't matter what book you reference. Different. And if it's, it, it's just like, no matter what it is, he comes across like, you know, kind of creepy when he's meant yeah. to come across as like a goofy, nerdy idiot. And yeah, problems. this is meant to be this is meant to be a meat cute or something. Yeah, and it's, and it's really it's a meat really awkward. Not. <laughs> yes, but then equally, as much as we're complaining about Reed here, he asks her what she's listening to. Yeah, and I feel so bad that the answer is Porter said because I I just don't feel like they they didn't need to get dragged into this. They they were. <laughs> They was they're they're just you know out there on the outskirts. They're safe. They don't need this problem. And now I I they're entwined in my brain. If I think about Fantastic Four, this version, I think yeah. about Porter's head. And if I That's think about sad. Porter's head, I think about this. And she manages to reduce music yeah. to its most dull, Full. beige, colorless mm. of pattern recognition. I'm into I'm into pattern recognition. recognition. Yeah, and, and then basically describes like ten percent of music as you know they the, the musician controls the pattern and you're waiting for the resolution and it's like yeah sometimes yeah but also hey let's let's say like all of pop music has got nothing to do mm. with pattern recognition or waiting to resolve something it's yeah it's it's a very small part that is actually represented in how she describes music and yeah it is <laughs> mm. it, it's like because i immediately thought this girl didn't do music theory did she um <laughs> like this wasn't this wasn't up there she's like music is patterns and therefore and i'm like so basically all you're listening to is pachelbel's canon that's really what you're listening to isn't it be honest sue that's where you're going there's no resolution in that either. Because pattern-wise, <laughs> that's a really patterny piece of music, and it's been referenced in many forms of music over the years. Mm-hmm. It's really frustrating how much that crops up. I mean, I think, you know, you can find it in Kali Minogue songs, for God's sake. So it's, yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, if you're talking about, you know, the origins of classical music, there are patterns and rules and that, but that's not the whole thing sue like i mean have you met jazz have you have you met pop music have you met grunge have you met garage have you met punk have you met music generally yeah it ha uh, it's it's a really annoying scene and you get this whole thing where reads are like oh is that is that what you're into like music and she's like no i'm into pattern recognition and that that ultimately is another thing that does actually play out later in the film but yeah. in the like worst le- way in the worst way possible and uh, in the same scene no less where the captain nemo reference becomes relevant <laughs> we'll get back to that <laughs> um oh i'm sure we will yeah um we also yeah, I actually I actually made a note. Music is patterns now. Question. Yeah. Mark. Uh, which is good because I, I I made I just made the, the note pattern recognition <laughs> question mark. Um, side by side with this, so like the following scene, I think we see Franklin, who's well, we should have probably cleared this up. Franklin Richards. Franklin Storm. Franklin Storm. God damn it. Doctor. Doctor Franklin Storm. Doctor Franklin Storm. Um, father and adoptive father of uh, Johnny and Sue. Yeah. Goes to see Victor. And yeah. basically it gives Victor a talk about how, like, this project's going to carry on, Vic, and you can be, you're, you're either with us or you're sat here in the dark, yeah, lunatic. Ah, come, yeah. come, come help us out. We got this smart kid now from, uh, from Oyster Bay. He knows some stuff about some things. Clean yourself up, kid. And this scene should be like a, a nice little intro to Victor. But instead, we just see a dude sat in his apartment. Mm. In the dark, he's got a little headset thing that allows him to open and close his blinds, apparently. That's all yeah. we see it do. And 
basically clean your yourself up, kid, is basically cut your damn hair, Victor. God yes. damn it. Like, don't shave, don't get changed, just cut your hair. Yeah. Ah. yeah. I'm not your dad, but if I was, uh, Ugh, the whole yeah. scene is like so so pointless. The whole it's like the scene not, before as well, which we've missed because there was a board meeting before that oh, where he gets Christ. name dropped. You missed the board one of many board meetings in this film. The board meeting does do something though, and what it does is introduces to the dullest most. <laughs> By the numbers, mm. government body representing good old the good old US of A, who yeah. just want to go to a different dimension for resources because yeah. capitalism. Who needs, yeah, who needs motivations? Who needs everything when you can just go just introduce a government body, nameless, of course. Yeah, and basically just tell us they're the bad guys. They want to do science for resources. Like, yeah, I saw Avatar. I get it. Fine. <laughs> but for the love yeah. of God, give me something, just anything to work with here. Because we're even told that the leader of this government body is Harvey. And yeah. there's this little bit that's like, okay, mole man is yeah. it? Interesting. And, and he looks a bit like he could go that way because he has no separation between chin and neck. What's worse is this is, I can't remember the actor's name. Um, He's not even a bad actor. He is... um, One second, I got this, I got this. Everyone's a bad actor in this, just by the very nature of the material which they are forced to deal with. Tim Blake Nelson. That's the dude. He... Not a bad actor. um, No? He's playing Harvey in this, and... um, (sighs) Is he still working? (laughs) here Here lies the problem. Yeah. He is, for the second time, cast. Cast to portray a villain in a, in a Marvel film that's not really made by Marvel in a second film that will never happen. Because he's casting this and he's basically, he's, he's Harvey Allen rather than being Harvey Elder, I think it is. Yeah, it's Elder, the, yeah. Um, and he's basically presented to us as, hey, this guy could be Mole Man. <laughs> little, little, little cheeky reference yeah. there for you. That's that's yeah, our second. That's an e- there's another Easter egg, yeah. And instead, nothing comes of it. Much like, was he meant to be the thinker in um, Incredible Hulk? Yes, he was. Yeah, gets, gets a little bit of Bruce Banner's blood in uh, in him yeah. somehow. I can't remember how. Probably, probably not important. And because of that, he, his head gets all big, and he's going to be the yeah, thinker. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And yeah. can you imagine being cast twice, twice <laughs> as super villains? You'll never actually get to play because of sheer lack of interest. Yes. Just no, nobody cares oh, about the thinker. Nobody cares about Mole Man because no. we're so heavily invested in retelling the Fantastic Four origin in the dullest possible way. Yes. So we must be coming up on like the half hour mark of the film. Probably, yeah. So we, we've we've gone through the board meeting of boredom. Board meeting is is indeed what it is. Um, and then Franklin goes and like sees Victor with his many screens, like Victor's some sort of I don't know internet troll. That's what I got from that yeah. scene. We're also told that he was a, he. Well, we're introduced to him in the board meeting as a concept, but as you mentioned before we started recording, he wasn't originally going to be Victor Von Doom, was he? No, he was Victor Domachev. And Toby Keppel, is Keppel, is that whoever plays Victor, yeah. um, has repeated this over and over and over again in interviews, bless his little heart, that originally it was going to be Victor Von Domachev. And yet, so that actually, and actually during filming, I think they had to ADR it over. And that's why we actually switched in the boardroom meeting to seeing Victor Von Doom written out on a piece of paper as the guy says it. Because ADRing Von Doom over Domachev is yeah, a little bit tricky. Work. 
No. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and I don't think after that scene, his surname is mentioned again, apart from when Sue's like, ah, oh, Dr. Doom over here. Yeah, and wink, that is wink. actually the only time he's referred to as Dr. Doom. Yeah. Um, yeah. With, with the exception of quite possibly my favorite part of this film, which we will, we will get, we'll get, we'll there. get to that. We'll, yeah. know what day of the week it'll be because this is <laughs> just agonizing to talk about. Um, we're, a third, we're a third of the way through. So, far. <laughs> so basically, despite being kind of a brat about it and refusing to go back with Franklin. Yeah. Victor does rejoin the project. He does. Yeah. Largely it seems because Sue is involved. Yet again, we have, and this is what, again, annoys me, is yet again, we have Victor's crush on Sue Storm being a catalyst for something. Like, in the original Fantastic Four film, it was a catalyst um, for Victor allowing Reed to come on the space station, so they all got cosmic powers. Um, And, you know, the whole rival with Reed throughout that film and then in Rise of the Silver Surfer, Sue is reduced to hey, the Silver Surfer really likes her because he has a crush on her because she looks like his wife Ooh. Yeah. and here again Sue is basically reduced to hey, Victor helps out because he's got this big crush on Sue and it's just like, I know she's a woman and I know these are heterosexual men But for the love of God, why do we have to go there yet again and have Victor help out purely because he likes Sue? Like, can't Victor just be like, I invented this and I'm going to be damned if I'm going to let some young upstart take credit for my project? Would have made more sense to me, wouldn't it? Yeah. There are so many ways this could have gone. You don't need to saddle Victor also with a crush on Sue that ultimately goes nowhere. Yeah, it, it it has no point, it serves no reason, it leads nowhere, other than the fact that he calls Reed out for being unprofessional because they're laughing at one point, they're bastard. How and, dare they? And there's not even, there's it, right, in the 2005 version, there's at least the whole thing that Sue and Doom are, are dating, and there's this yeah. whole kind of like, hey, Reed, you're getting all up in my business here. We're a happy kind of couple thing thing yeah in this it's literally just like victor's annoyed because both him and reed like the same girl but not enough to do anything about it and are both ignorant to the fact that they, that she does not care either of them exist exactly yeah they are fighting an imaginary war over a girl who couldn't care less <laughs> which is right which is another problem here isn't it because even though we see Various women walking around the science facility. Yeah. Sue Storm is the only named female character yes. in this film. Mm. I wondered when we were going to get to that, yeah. I, I, mean, I was going to save it for later because I've got a much longer rant prepared, but I feel like we can... Yeah, ca- let's, let's go into it, in it now. Because, I mean, the only other female character we actually see speak is Ben Grimm's mother when she's telling off his older brother for beating him up. And, I mean, that's not, that's, she's not even a character. She's a flipping stereotype of, you know, protective mother who beats up her son for beating up her other son kind of thing. She's, she's a non-entity, frankly. Mm -hmm. Sue Storm is literally the only woman. And it's, it's, I mean, I get the fantastic, of the Fantastic Four, yeah, Reed, Ben, and um, Johnny are all men. I get that. Yeah. There's only one woman actually in the Fantastic Four. But dear God, I mean, at least in the 2005 one, we had that whole thing with Debs. And yeah. his fiance, who was terrible, admittedly. But I mean, at least we had that. We de- And that was like the bare minimum of representation. And we get the introduction of Alicia as well, right? Oh, yeah. And we get Alicia. I forgot Alicia. That's really bad because I... there's I can't remember her name, but there is the like science nurse woman that you know Johnny oh, yeah, that Johnny does snowboarding on. with. Yeah, and I mean, it's not good female representation, but at least we have more than one speaking female. Yeah, she's in two whole scenes as well. That's like an yeah. impressive thing. When I, I just can't believe that be- we've gone backwards in ten years. Yeah. 
we've gone backwards. Yes, we have, you know, we have a block black johnny storm so yay up in the diversity again i mean everyone else is white but you know up in the diversity and then yeah but what about the female represent you you just it's like we can either Mm. do a bit of diversity with a black johnny storm or we could have some female characters now we'll go with black johnny storm because then we've ticked the box we've done diversity done i i just don't get why this film couldn't have had more characters that well, I do because the what, what time would they have had on screen? But the <laughs> yeah. fact that it just shows no interest in the idea of introducing female characters, and the one the one we do get, man, they treat Sue bad, and we don't run, we're going to get to that. That's that's in my uh, that's that's in my notes pretty soon. So oh, good, good. Just, just to foreshadow that, not only is there only one woman. She's yeah. treated terribly. So, yeah. okay. So, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to mention because we're coming up to the my first note of the wig. Because I feel we need to mention the wig now. So, as many people will know, there were extensive reshoots on this film. Yes. And they were done literally the same year it was released. They were, it was pretty damn close to the wire. So, Kate Mara, you'll notice her hair changes quite a lot anyway, depending on how how much she's dyed her hair that week, it would seem. It's, it is a uh, Sue Storm trait, though, isn't it, to yeah. restyle her hair between every scene in the film? We've learned this. <laughs> yeah, that's what you do. Um, and one of the things in the reshoots is she starts wearing a very obvious blonde wig. Now, mm. uh, we've ranted about blonde wigs before. Let's Sue. <laughs> be brunette hashtag let's see be brunette i just failed to understand why we had i mean kate mara is not a natural blonde why on earth we had a a dyer hair to start with to make her look blonde so t- i mean you've got a black johnny storm you are clearly not bothered about people's hair color and then we shove her in this horrendously obvious blonde wig and the first meeting between Victor and Reed in that room where there's a little bit of, yeah, I like Sue, yeah, I like her more kind of subtext going on. Sue is wearing a blonde wig. And I think that's the first instance. But then for the rest of the film, it's going to crop up every other scene virtually. She's literally going to leave one scene with natural hair and walk into the next scene wearing a goddamn wig. Yes, also because she'd cut her hair between filming and not filming and filming again i think there are little glimpses of the inconsistency because the blonde wig is longer than her hair even before it's been cut if that makes sense yeah it's longer than the original hair she had in the film there's no effort for the wig she's been given to look like the hair she had no there isn't it's like picked randomly she we need a blonde wig oh oh what have you got oh that one will do it's the right color it's I not just, even the right colour, but yeah. Yeah, I, I just... Uh, it's it's one of a thousand problems, let's be honest. We're in an <laughs> ocean of problems. We're drowning amongst these problems. So, after after Reed comes on board... Uh, no, after... Victor. After Victor comes on board, they basically almost immediately get the machine up and running. Well, we have that whole bit. Then we have Johnny's scene. Then we then we have yeah. Johnny, which we've already talked about, about how we get glimpses of the Johnny storm that could be. And Franklin is like, hey, yes. my son built a car that one time. Let's bring him in on this project. It's not at all because, you know, nepotism. And also I want to control my son's general, you know, future by blackmailing him and say, look, if you help with this science project... And yeah. you can you can have your car back that you wrote off because you're a reckless soul. Um, yeah, and then immediately they start building it, and we get one of the worst montages since Baywatch. <laughs> I'm gonna throw it out there. It's it's the kind of montage you can't really remember. I think is. Yeah, which is why it's one of the worst sorts. Because a montage should, it, you should be like, oh, that you know, there should be music. It should be exciting. It should be like the training montage in Rocky on some level. Yeah. You should get that emotional reaction. 
I remember there's a montage, but purely because I wrote it down. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, Angela. The montage did not stick with me. <laughs> I, I can't really... I assume there was some welding and some computer typing and there that. There was definitely some welding, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, and a time lapse. There was a time lapse of them building the the interdimensional yes. pod travel thing. Um, that's right. And we see a little bit of, like, Sue, like, clipping a piece of glass into the helmet and... That's it, yeah. Um, just, just, you know, but it's, uh, and again, revisiting the problem, scientists yeah. Yeah. do the theory, yeah. engineers mm-hmm. build the things. In yeah. For some reason, in cinema and in comics, yeah. if you're a scientist... You do everything. There are no other jobs. You you basically you conceive science. it, make it, experiment on yourself, and turn yourself into an elastic band. It's yeah. You do all the things, all the science, all the time, and it's yeah. It's just like, but the problem with this montage as well is a montage should going back to the Rocky training montage, which is probably the most famous one in cinematic yeah, history. Yeah. It's either that or Team America. And I mean, yeah. <laughs> time moves fast in a montage. It does. But it should tell you something about the characters while they're doing this. I learn nothing from this montage about any of them. You know why that all. is? You, you, of course, know why that is, though, Angela, right? Because they're non existent characters. It's nothing to learn. Yeah. It's. it's... Well, they don't. One of my favorite bits. So. I, I I took notes while I was watching this, as you might have guessed. Yeah. And what Ma- Marta made two comments that stuck with me. One was five minutes in, she was bored. Fair. Uh, and about twenty minutes in, maybe half an hour, she pointed out that it's like they're trying to do emotions <laughs> and focus on characters. But not very well. And it's like they're trying to make them real people. But not really. And <laughs> She's absolutely right. It, it's the most true thing. Everything is like... Yeah, yeah there's, there's, oh, there's depth and there's character work. It's like, this is not Jeff Lemire writes the Fantastic Four. The character work here is so, so starved for like detail that it's yeah. like... There's nothing to learn. They, you can try and give them emotions and character and build a concept, but there isn't enough time in this film to, like, tell us about one guy, let alone, like, Four. the entire Fantastic Four, Victor Von Doom, Franklin, Harvey, the villain. And it's, <laughs> yeah. There's no space to tell yeah. us, to do any character work, because there's just no... How would you do it? When would you do it? Where would you do it? And, yeah, and that's the thing. Is like we're now probably forty minutes in, maybe. Yeah, this I film has to that. end in one hour's time. Yeah, and it just feels like not a lot has happened, and we don't know these. So not a lot happens in the plot because time skips are our friend. We've yeah. learned nothing. It's just like, this is what a robot, this is what Herbie the Robot thinks a Fantastic Four film is. <laughs> it is. It feels like this is what an artificial intelligence who is learning about cinema would come up with. Like, yeah. we must have characters and they say things to each other and also time passes. It's, yeah, it's like join the dots together, small computer program. Yeah, and... At, at this point, after after the quote unquote montage, because yeah. if, if you can't remember it, is it really a montage? If you don't <laughs> learn anything, I don't know. It's um, just a series of pictures. We we see a test of our oh god reality hopping machine with a, a, a f- strangely f- familiar looking kind of chimp strapped yeah. into it. I'm pretty sure that's one of Caesar's kids there from Planet of the Apes. It's and don't get me wrong, it's it's Fox and Fox also did Planet of the Apes. Um, 
Yeah. But it's it's like a, a direct CGI lift from another it's, film. It is so obviously that. That's what gets me. Like, you couldn't tweak the model even a little bit. It's like you have literally taken this model from Planet of the Apes and just dropped it in there. You may even have used the same animation as you may have used facial expressions as used in one of the Planet of the Apes films. You're not even trying. You're literally just <laughs> stealing somebody's baby chimp and throwing it in there. <laughs> and it's just, there's no, I mean, we know that the budget went hideously wrong because mm. reshoots eat money like no tomorrow, as we know. And it didn't have a, it had, I think the original budget was about 120 million ish, which is, you can make a good film with that and you can afford light bulbs with that. It doesn't have to be this dark. Uh, but the reshoots bumped it up to $155 million and there was no money left to do 3D conversion or anything like that. So clearly budget was a thing. But still, surely you have enough money to do something with your chimp model because I was just waiting for Caesar to, you know, come on in and be like, you stole my child or something and, you know, just bring in the gorilla and just the whole lot of them come in Beat the scientists up. That would have been a better film, frankly. It would have been a solid swerve, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Um, twist, this is, uh, this is a Planet of the Apes film all along. <laughs> yes. It was Earth all along, sorry. Well done. Thank um, you. So we get a little... Af- after the successful test with the blatant CGI monkey from another oh. franchise... <laughs> There's, there's a little bit where Harvey is all like, ah, oh, sweet, let me get NASA on the phone because, you know, get them in here. You suckers aren't going to another planet, obviously. We've got to get professionals in. And th- there's a problem here because Harvey is right. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's like, yeah, you guys built the technology and you want to... There are professional people who are experts in exploring different worlds. This, Yeah. We... You you guys are just some kids. Why why would I, why would we risk sending you kids? Can you imagine the scandal if we kill four kids by chucking you in an alien planet that we know nothing about except monkeys can survive there for a short period? Yeah, it's like Harvey isn't wrong, but then when Dooms are like, sure, let's call in the CIA and the army and blah, blah, blah he's also not wrong. Everybody is right yeah. in this scene. But it's like... <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. Everybody is right, and yet everybody is wrong. Yeah, it's like they're trying to present it that, like, Doom's throwing his toys out of the pram. It's like, yeah, he is, but he's right. It is his project. And Harvey's right but in going, well, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say it, yeah. but you, you guys are just some, some kids who happen to be quite good at science in garages. It doesn't mean... Yeah. We should send you to a different universe. Um, but we also get a Civil War reference at this point. Yeah. <laughs> when Victor's, Easter egg. Dad. Yeah. Easter egg three, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Where Doom's all like, yeah, you know, we can send all our prisoners there. And it's like, I understood that reference. Yeah. So, yeah. Civil War. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Negative zone. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Proving again that... See, that's the thing, is because, of course, that in Civil War is Reed Richards' idea. Yeah. Proving again that Reed is the worst. But it's like, no, it's such a villainy thing. We'll give that line to Victor. Who, I can't stress enough, other than at one point talking about how, you know, he's done with Earth. Earth, you know, it's its own problem. Old old people have, have ruined Earth, and why should he solve yeah. it? And again, unfortunately, this is depicted that Victor's meant to be the bad guy. Mm. Whilst in another more millennial way, yeah. <laughs> Victor's yeah. right. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Um, stop, stop just assuming that you can just mine resources from an alien planet and that'll, yeah. that'll fix problems. And Victor's wrong because he thinks, you know you shouldn't have screwed Earth up in the first place and now rely on everyone else to solve your problems. Um, Victor's right. Victor's yeah. consistently right up until he's he's 
no longer present, basically. I think it's... Yes. Uh, that, that's um, fair to say. And this is where the problems really begin for me. And I oh, can't gosh. believe... Yeah. Because yeah. this is where they get all grumpy and start drinking from a out tiny, of, tiny flask. Yeah, out of a tiny flask. My mum noticed this because she was like, how have they managed to get, I mean, not even drunk, but buzzed? Because this is a tiny flask. There's probably, unless this is like pure alcohol in there, yeah. which will kill you. There is not enough alcohol in that shared between the three of them. To get them even a little bit buzzed, really. Let's be honest. Yeah. Because it's it's such a tiny flask. It's small. It's thin. It's the kind of thing that people, you know, take out when they go shooting. I imagine that's the thing people. Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Whenever people take small, Makes small flasks. Go grab my shooting flask. Yeah. And it's like so you're sharing this between and and now you're 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 drunk, are you? Uh, okay. So, but you're not drunk. In like the traditional sense, in the you know, you just get drunk to the point where you start talking about astronauts and how everyone remembers Neil Armstrong because he was like on the moon, man. Um, and that's the drunkenness, and you're still able to operate equipment. And also, for some reason, you ring Ben in yeah. the middle of the night. He answers the phone, even though you're clearly drunk and really. Ben should do what most people should do when they get called late at 3 a.m. by a drunk friend and just, you know, go, you're drunk, just go to sleep and put the phone down. Ben mysteriously makes the journey from Oyster Bay. How is unclear? Does he have a car? Does he fly? Who's to say? Um, And he just gets there in the middle of the night so they can test this and they decide to do it because they're drunk. Yeah, and at this point, we, we basically see that Ben, Reed, Johnny, and Doom, Victor, yeah. are going to hop in their space suits, hop in their teleporter, and nip over to Planet Zero. Completely ignoring that Sue Storm exists, has worked on the project with yeah. them. He's one of their sisters, and yeah. two of them have a crush on her. And... My Ben's note never of, met him in his defence. Ben's never met Ben's him. not the problem here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, he did meet at the science fair, but yeah. True. I, I'm not sure how much that counts, but yeah. yeah. But that leads to my note at this point being four words. Yeah. Those four words being just such fucking bullshit. <laughs> I mean, my note at this point is is... Where the hell is Sue? Because I'd forgotten that she doesn't go the first time round to planet zero negative. Um, And my mum was like, so they're going to get their powers by going to this planet zero. And I'm like, yeah. She's like, so where's Sue in this then? Why doesn't she get to go? So my mum, a non-comic book reader, it must be said, figured out that, yeah, there's something not quite right here yeah it's (sighs) there are many problems here firstly both doom and reed say that they're not the person who's gonna go they're gonna stay back on earth they both talk about how they're not the astronaut yeah and then both decide actually fuck it yeah we are the astronauts um Mm. equally there's no reason for the entire structure of this teleported device, teleported teleporting device, to have four coffin-shaped pods. You can have like a um, Apollo Eagle type deal with yeah. as many seats as you want. You don't need to limit this to make Sue Storm like surplus to requirements. You don't need to sideline the only female lead you have. And I use. Th- female lead loosely because at this point jamie bell who's been sat in a fucking junkyard in new york state gets rang up in the middle of the night it's like yeah. hop on the train bro come on over let's go to a different dimension you think this is fine right right i'm reed why, why would i not be okay this is this yeah. is a legit good idea man i've never led you wrong before remember that car that got all sandy in that plane i destroyed yeah, and the time I blew out the entire power grid of our local area. And and yet, here we are 
where they all, all board up, jump dimensions. Sue gets an alert because she's got like, I don't know, text reminders set up or like yes. Facebook yeah. text alerts from 2015 that go, hey it's man, I think, I think, I think you, your mates just hijacked your uh, teleporting device. She rushes in to get all typey because that's how we communicate. We type hard and aggressive. Yeah, science. They they pop out on Planet Zero with the intention of planting the flag, being the first footprints and beating NASA to it. Yeah. And in planting the flag, pa-pow, the Earth cracks beneath them and is this green light yeah. leading away into the void, essentially. Yeah, because essentially where they land... It looks very like Mordor. It, <laughs> it's, it's very Mordory. Or as my mum referred to it, that place from Thor, the bad Thor film, which is Thor the Dark World. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I see it. Yeah, that, that's where she went with that. And it's like, and also it's like, so you're just going to plant a flag and hope to God that that doesn't cause any problems because you've not actually looked at the terrain or anything. But, hey, they planted a flag on the moon, so, yeah. So it we works, should and do. that didn't crack. Yeah, the moon didn't crack. Therefore, this will be absolutely fine. It's, it's weird because then, basically, Victor leads the charge, and he's like, hey, sweet, mighty green over there. That's kind of my colour <laughs> scheme. And goes stomping towards this, like, lake of green yeah over a cliff they oh, over to... a cliff you gotta climb they've, brought, they've brought climbing equipment As for did. some reason yeah. <laughs> you know in a drunken stupor they've had the foresight to bring some climbing equipment to this planet that they didn't even know had massive cliffs they were going to have to repel down but hey yeah and literally the second they get out of the pods ben is like nope earth I, yeah. I'm in over my head. I'm just some kid. Earth. I'm going to get back in. I'm, yeah, I'm gone. I, I'm and, going. And then as they're getting towards this cl- cliff, Johnny's like, I- I'm actually with Ben on this. Can we, like, just not do whatever this is? We wanted to be the first people here. You're all like, let's jump off a cliff. And then they start going like, hey, there's no energy expenditure coming from this green goo. It's like... What are you talking about? This is just green goo. What what does that mean? Yeah. What 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 kind of tricorder bullshit are you pulling here where you're just waving yeah. a fucking thing at it going, ah, this is this is special Wait. goo. Yeah. Um then Doom decides to have a poke at it, which historically we've learned in sci-fi I films. Mean, it's just like always the first rule, if you end up on an alien planet where there is something gooey or it looks a bit weird. You don't touch the damn thing. Yeah. This is this is the case. This is uh, it's just uh, it, um, it's frustrating because it's like this is a science fiction trope. It doesn't mean you have to put it in your film. Well, here's like, the problem. We're told in this film, nonetheless, that Reed Richards, he's read his Jules Verne. He knows his classic sci-fi. He should be right there. Or like, whoa, 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 Vic, don't go poking yeah. that. He'll turn you into some kind of weird alien monster thing, and then you'll never be able to leave. I read a book on it once, and it's instead it's like, as a bit of a poke, bit of an explosion, everybody tries to run away. Yeah. Victor gets dragged back down by the green goo. Yeah. And they assume he's died, hop back, well, attempt to hop back in their pods yeah. to send them back where they kind of you know they get sue on the blower and she's yeah. all like yeah yeah, yeah I'm, I'm working yeah, I'm on it guys typing. i'm typing here <laughs> and i'm typing so hard guys yeah and then ben like can't close the door of his pod and all these rocks, rocks. start coming in with yeah. him because everything's crumbling around him and then yeah. johnny's like window gets blown Fire. out and he bursts yeah. into flame and um, nothing happens to reed at all no reed seems to be fine he's not like no one's like flicking rubber stretching. bands at him and he's not like stretching to try and close the door nothing zilch as yeah. far as i can see and if i'm wrong by all means tweet us instagram us, us um facebook us leave a comment i don't know something. yeah 
hit me up if 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 Reed got his powers from something and I missed it. Let he's know, like doing some resistance well. bands, or so I don't know. Yeah. But he isn't, as far as I no. can see. No. Um, and yeah, you know, everything kind of goes nuts. They get back to the lab. The lab explodes naturally, yeah. as you yeah. do. In in with 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 blue light because all comic book explosions involve blue light. True facts. Yeah. Just... <laughs> and Sue gets hit and knocked out. Yeah, she gets hit by like a wave of energy coming off of this thing. And she gets this kind of slightly shiny, shimmery thing where she kind of flashes yeah. it out of existence. Johnny's yeah. all on fire on the floor. Ben's yeah. all like a pile of rocks. Rocks, Reed's. And Reed's got his leg trapped under something. He's like, I'm coming back. Ben, yeah. Ben. And my mum liked this bit because at this point she said, oh, that's it then. That's the end, is it? They're all they're all dead. That's the end. I'm what a great cool. what a great ending. <laughs> and I'm like, no, sadly there's more of this film to come. But she's like, well that would have been a really good ending because that would have been like a moral tale to the youngsters <laughs> about <laughs> about science and how, you know, you have to be careful or it'll backfire. It's a really good little horror story. End it there. See, and they did those words, a really good little horror story, are actually t- actually tie into what I had to say as this film goes on. And it's going to be one of my wrap-up points. So keep that in mind. I will bear that in mind. So what we actually get is that everyone's taken to a mystery military facility. <laughs> Area 57, which oh, begs the question. God, is it? Yeah, it's Area Fifty Seven. I'm not. I noted that down. Um, yeah, so there's Area Fifty One is where we keep the UFOs. Yeah, Area Fifty Seven is where we keep the people who've been involved in science accidents, causing them to develop abnormal things. I want to know what is Area Fifty Two, Fifty Three, Fifty Four, Fifty Five, and Fifty Six doing? What are they about? What you know? I want to watch that film, Area 53. I think that could be a hit there. Obviously, one of them's where the mutants are. Clearly, yeah. Um, and one of them's got to be that facility that we see in Rise of the Silver Surfer. Yeah, yeah. The one that's in Russia for reasons. <laughs> for reasons. Yeah. Despite Latveria being right there. Yeah, that's the um, Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the real thing. To leave that with me, I'll um, yeah. I'll put out some ideas. Um, yeah, so here we are at Area Fifty Seven, <laughs> where everyone's been separated and is being monitored. Basically, okay, well, this is one of my favorite scenes actually. So we've got um, yeah. we've got like Reed layout, real long man. Reed's like Reed's, Only- Reed's real, real long. <laughs> Except for his neck, mysterious. Neck's fine. Neck's Arms okay. are like ten feet apiece. Same with his legs. Yeah. And that he's all like shouting about, hey, "Where are my friends, yo?" It's like, and the scientists are like, just just dope him up, will you? God, he's pissing me off with all this stretchy <laughs> bullshit again. Yeah. Um, we see Johnny just lying on a bed on fire. Nothing else. No twist. Yeah, no yeah, like. No. It's just there going. <laughs> I, uh, just, just I, I realize no one can see me now. Other no than one you. can see you doing yeah. that, but I can. And yeah, it's, it's just Johnny lying there on fire, moves around a little bit, sits up, goes a little bit supernova, blows out all the windows, lies back down. <laughs> yeah. But then we get my my favorite part of this. We see Sue Storm lying on a table, yeah. flat, t- turning invisible and then turning yeah. visible. And then just invisible while it's explained to her, you know, adopted father, Franklin, what the deal is here. Yeah. And he has this kind of sad moment of staring into an empty room at a table that may or may not have his daughter on it. And just, yeah. it's just like, how, how did they film this? Did they really just have him like, just, just look sad at the stretcher? Just yeah. <laughs> we've feel- given Ke- yeah, we've given Kate Mara the day off. So you just have to look. This is where she'd be. We can't give you any eyeline points because we've not got the money to digitally remove them. Yeah. So, so just yeah. be sad at this room. Thanks. Yeah. It's 
oh, I beg so many questions. And then we kind of see Reed wakes up and he can hear Ben screaming and he somehow goes crawling through the vents, diehard style. Ben, ben, who is basically a pile of rocks. Yeah, he's got no legs. He's just half half pile of rocks, half rock person. Yeah. He's got, he's got like an arm and a head, I think. Maybe two arms. Yeah. And Reed goes through the vents like Earthworm Jim. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they have this kind of like... Reed, don't leave me. And he's like, man, I got, I got to bail. They're going to like... <laughs> like what? what? This is the thing. Reed knows zero things about what's going on right now. Takes one look at his friend, the pile of rocks, and decides <laughs> that's enough. Don't I'm out. out of there. Yeah. And I, it's I, like, he doesn't even know where this facility is. It could be in the middle of the bloody Sahara Desert for all he knows. Yeah. Or, you know, Siberia, because they like to put bases in Russia. True. Um and it's like, no, I don't know where I am. I don't know what's going on. I've not really had time to formulate a plan because literally all I did was get up off the table because I heard you crying, Ben. And, you know, part of me does feel for you, but not enough to stick around and actually help you. I'm just going to bugger off and hope to God that I can get out and, you know, catch a lift so I can go and live in South Central America way later on um, while I leave you to... I really feel for Ben because, like, Ben doesn't seem to have much, well, many friends. Like, this is the first time he's really heard from Reed, apart from the fact that Reed took a selfie with the thing yeah. in in months. So the guy rings him up drunk late night and's like, let's go to an alternate dimension. And Ben's like, look, you're my best friend for some reason that's never established because our characters are not established. Yeah. I'll do that. And then I hideously end up mutated into a pile of rocks. And now you're leaving me. Like, poor Ben. There's there's also a a frustration I have here that Ben, as we see later on, blames all of this on Reed with good reason. And Johnny blames all this on his dad with good reason. Yeah. However... That could lead to, like, a Johnny and Ben friendship relationship. It was like, hey, we've both been dragged into this, and it wasn't really what we wanted. Yeah. It doesn't, though. It doesn't lead to anything. Because the whole, the strongest thing, as we've noted from the previous Fantastic Four films, yeah. is the Ben and Johnny relationship yeah. and scenes. We get none of that. We don't. Get, there is no family they, vibe or dynamic here. They do not interact. John and Ben. John and Benny? Johnny and Ben, John and Benny. I mean, you know, you could call them that. They have literally no interactions apart from at the very end. Like you can count on one hand the number of lines they actually aim at each other. I mean, at least there is a scene with Johnny and Sue, which is kind of obligatory because we have to have Johnny say that he blames his dad and all that kind of thing. And, you know, maybe this is what we're meant to be, Sue. And she's like, "Uh, you know, maybe not uh, siblings. So you get that. But, yeah, honest to God, it's like, how do you misunderstand the Fantastic Four as a found family this badly, guys? How? You know what makes this all worse? And this is something that occurred to me at the time of watching, obviously. Um, Don't know what I'm talking about. Ben lives and presumably works in a junkyard in Oyster Bay. Yeah. Johnny has built a car from scratch in New York City. Now, if we just get Oyster Bay and we just drag it a little bit closer to New York City, it might not be a real place. It can be anywhere. If you just put all of this on the outskirts of New York City, suddenly, yeah, Johnny and Ben know each other. There's a connection there. You could give us a few little scenes where the, he's like helping him out build a car or whatever. Just a little bit to be like a connection between and Johnny and Ben know each other and, you know... They both don't they don't really get along, but they've got this kind of awkward friend dynamic. And instead, it's like, no, these are just two independent things that are happening that have no connection. We've not thought about it. We don't care. Yeah. And it it's infuriating because 
whilst there's so much that you can the, the building cars selling parts of cars thing is a friendship connection the we're both here and we weren't meant to be connection yeah. and instead it's just no we're both playing out quite similar character develop character arcs in oh uh, we're both accidentally here we just know someone else and instead it's like there's not enough space for both of you to have the same character mm. arc if they don't matter or relate or connect you if they don't make you best friends or at least friends or like yeah what's the point don't don't just put things in there's no space to be just throwing plot lines at us just because you got them i yeah oh man because it is like you said you have it's like you had the perfect setup for reed and ben to bond as small children you ignored it you've got the perfect setup for johnny and ben to bond like you could even have them as the engineers because let's face it ben's probably as qualified to help on this project as an engineer as johnny is you could have had them as the engineers on this project and had reed and sue and i mean victor's a whole other issue but reed and sue is victor's a black hole of question marks (laughs) well i've come out with some really odd and a black hole of question marks an ocean of whatever problems, i said earlier yeah. an ocean of problems, problems yeah but you could have had reed and sue doing like the theoretical sciencey stuff and then they i don't know maybe just even have them together open the film at the baxter institute and have some background that reed and johnny no reed and ben have come from one direction and ben's in the engineering department and reed's in the science and same with sue and johnny and have johnny and ben meet in the engineering department and then they're dragged into the science bit that reed and Mm. sue have been doing with the theoretical science and then they build the thing like it seems that there are way more obvious ways to get these characters together and simple ways that they could have interacted with each other. And you just blatantly ignore that in favour of nothing. Yeah, it's it's insane. The the choices made show no interest in what the film has got because it's got so much potential. There's so much you could do and I don't know why it does none of it. And it, it makes, as we've covered, it makes some really odd choices and mistakes. Um, after Reed bails and escapes and leaves Ben yeah. behind. It's one year later. Not, not quite yet. Oh, we not ca- quite yet. We kind of get a little glimpse that Ben is going on covert missions. Right. Oh, yeah. It's like including you, the Bowman quote. Bowman comes along. Yeah. Yeah. Um, He's been active in covert operations. He's literally a 10 foot tall man made from rocks, tearing tanks in half. That's not even slightly covert. No. It's, it's just one of those things where it's like covert operations. What's he do? Tear tanks in half. Yeah. We, we, we just drop him out of planes. It was in the trailer. We cut that footage from the film, of course, but... Yeah, he, he he does the kind of Captain America just jumping out. No, it doesn't need a yeah. It doesn't a need a shoot. How many shoots rocks. do we need? He's he's a pile of rocks. We just drop him on problems. Um, yeah. but the whole concept is like, and, and we're gonna get Johnny involved. He's gonna be like a black ops agent. It's like literally a man on fire. Sue yeah. Susan Storm can turn invisible. Make force fields and apparently fly oh my god we'll get on to that because that your funny. choices are fire boy and the amazing rock monster no point of this yeah. is like covert no. you you don't get to call it like black ops if it's literally like representative of the elements i'm sorry <laughs> yeah. no earth wind and fire rock. <laughs> then it's one year later yeah, Which... and presumably in that year, they went around and deleted all the news footage about this guy who is made of rocks going along the Cannonballing out of well. carrier planes. Yeah, basically the last year has been spent trying to erase that. You know, like they go, they, they put things on the internet, they, they go after people. Like, you know, there's so many YouTube videos that have been taken down of Ben Grimm. <laughs> That's... So- one year later has a special place in my heart because when I saw this in the cinema, 
one of the people I was with was Joe of uh, Oh yes. Who who writes for bigger than capes.com, incidentally, if you've not checked out the site yet. Yeah. Um Joe, entertaining film. <laughs> Joe was quite drunk in this film, which can only have made it a little bit more palatable, I imagine. I um, imagine it was better that way, yeah. Don't know why we decided to go for drinks beforehand, but hey. I, actually, no, I know exactly why we went for drinks before, beforehand. And one year later, nearly killed Joe. It's I've never seen someone, like, <laughs> cry laughing at literally three words it's so every time i see that little like one year later thing it's like yeah man this this is funny because it has to be it has to be funny because otherwise it just is a suggestion that reed richards is such a garbage person he left his only friends in the entire world behind for one calendar year after he's left one of his mates in an alternate reality yeah, for a, for a year. For a year. So it has to be funny, doesn't it, Angela? Because otherwise it it's horrible. It's <laughs> literally the yeah. worst thing a man could do. Yeah. But we see him, like, you know, buying scrap to try and make machines to try and save the day, I guess. And he seems to have hooked himself up with some kind of weird, like frankenstein tron suit that like i guess helps with the stretching but i mean that's what they've done so in the in the best fantastic four film um we have this whole that because they were wearing their suits when they got hit by the cosmic rays they have been altered at the molecular level like they have and that's why it'll go invisible or it'll be fine if johnny's on fire or it'll stretch with reed or ben can wear it um whereas here you've got two lots of suits and they are immensely boring but it's like we've got to make these suits practical so like johnny's suit is going to allow him to flame on and flame off and jesus what a waste of a line that was yeah it, it's kind of insinuated that the suits are controlling the powers a little yeah. bit. Yeah. yeah. So he's got like a little thing that he can tap to turn his flames on and off. Yeah. Um, Sue has short sleeves because she's a woman, I assume, but also gloves. So this makes no sense, does Which, it? Which, I have to say, might be the most ultimate comics of designs. Yes, it is. And I, I think even in the in the Hickman run, they have like those short sleeves with yeah. gloves, don't they, for a while? So yeah, I, 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 I hate it. I hate it so much. <laughs> <laughs> ben doesn't even have a suit because apparently he's just rocks now, so he doesn't wear to ne- need to wear any form of clothing at all. That's right. That is correct. And then, bizarrely, because this is the military who've come up with these, or whoever it is who's, you know, working at Area 57, um, they've come up with that. And then, mysteriously, Reed, who is in another country has somehow come up with a suit that uses the same sort of colour scheme, i.e. boring black, and also is a practical controller thing for his powers in that it's got... Little... He, he's also got, like, bangles around him he's and got stuff. He's got bangles. That helps. I don't know. Yeah. And I'm like, how on earth have you, Reed, ended up designing something that is so like your friend's outfits? Have you, in fact, been spying on them? You've not got in touch with them. You've not sent them an encrypted text message to say, hi, guys, working on getting you out of there. None of that. Maybe you've hacked the military feed and you've found the designs for their terrible, terrible suits and you're like, oh, I need one of those also, so I will make my own, but it will match Mm. theirs because we're a team. It just... He he is at least a little grungy around the edges, and I assumed it was meant to follow this kind of through line that he's like a DIY genius. Um, But, yeah, we kind of get glimpses that he's been on Google looking for rock monsters and fire people. and Yeah. Ultimately, Um, this is his undoing because um, Sue looks for the pattern recognition and finds that his username is like captain nemo with like numbers for some of the letters and And an underscore yeah and making reed richards 
the kind of genius that's also a complete idiot. Because let's be honest, the yeah. only thing he's told anyone is that he likes Jules Verne. He could have named himself after the protagonist from any number of sci-fi films. I I was going to yeah. use the use uh, the time machine as an example then, and I don't think we find out his name. So I can't remember the guy's <laughs> name. I would have, I would have gone from I would have just called myself Hal from. Um, so he doesn't want a space odyssey. Not bad, yeah. I'd have gone with hell, but hey, never I, mind. I, I feel like he could have ran with, let's be honest, any reference to the to, to the Fantastic Four at this point. <laughs> he could have called him. Do you know what would have been good if he'd have actually called himself Mister Fantastic? Yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, it would be that, cheesy that would... as all hell, but at yeah. least it would have been a reference. And this is the thing because. The exact opposite of this, as usernames go, is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah. The, the comic. We know, we find out, like, early on that Donatello's username on whatever forums he's using to get tech knowledge is Does Machines 84 which is the most, like, good job, guys. You've nailed yeah. that. And you've completely you've re- you've referenced the theme song, and it means yeah, something, yeah. and it's it it tells you a little something about Donatello, whilst ultimately being infinitely dumb. And yeah. this is like no, it's Captain Nemo because we need there to be a reference to earlier in the film. We also yeah. need this to reference right now that Sue does pattern recognition. Um, oh yeah, but she can't. She can't do it until she has music like she can't see the patterns until she has the music and it's like so basically you have it's not even a superpower it's just a natural ability to look for patterns but you can only do it while listening to music what even is that it's like saying i can i've got a really good memory but only if i'm listening to the spice girls it's like (laughs) And now that you mention it. (laughs) (laughs) That's what it feels like. Like, No, I've got really good handwriting. If, um, you know, if I'm listening to The Who, my handwriting is so good. (laughs) It's perfect. It's like, why does she... What? Yeah, it's... I can can get on board with the whole, oh, it helps me concentrate kind of angle or whatever. But in that scene, it's like... Please stop trying to lazily shoehorn in here that Sue has got this character trait where she, you know, listens to Portis head and solves problems because it's not yeah. real, is it? It's just nonsense. No. Um, I'd feel better if we like saw her like in a Portis head T-shirt at some point or like, I don't know. Just anything some... to suggest she has interest in music beyond patterns. Yeah, I don't I don't know what it would involve. I don't know how you would shoehorn that into a film that's desperately shoehorning in all the things <laughs> all the time. Um, so she finds Reed. Yeah. And we actually legitimately... Get a pretty good scene here where Reed fights off a, a, a like group of Area Fifty Seven soldiers, and we actually see him be all stretchy and he's like knocking guys out, throwing them against trees, and it's this moment of like, well, where the fuck has this been for the first hour? Because yeah, giving us just a little bit of reed doing an action sequence fighting off some soldiers actually feels worthwhile and it's like yeah okay so what while this isn't particularly in character with reed it it at least showcases the superpowers in a film desperately starved from superpowers (laughs) it's a pretty good scene i quite like it i yeah it's it's the in in a film that is desperate to not have action scenes in it Yes, for some reason, despite yeah. being a superhero film. No, we don't have act- action in superhero films. What what madness is that? Um, I especially like at the end, Ben just, like, headbutts him. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because I kind of expected, like, a uh, indent in his face of, like, rocks or something. So we yeah. would have got that in 2005, damn We would have got that in 2005. And I would have gotten there. I feel like this entire film is desperate to not play for laughs when it could and it would make it a better film yeah because we can't have humor in a superhero film either no, god no it's gotta be 
this kind of grayscale um, sad affair with no joy. Because I, I feel like I know what the target audience of this film was intended to be, and this was meant to be like a Hunger Games teen audience. Yeah. But with none of the things that appeal to that audience. Yeah, pretty much. It was like, what do, what are the kids like? Well, you know, they like dark places that you can't see what's going on, and they don't like humour, and they don't like a lot of action. Yeah, that's that's what the kids really That's like. right. No, absolutely no fun all the time. Yeah. Um. So after uh, after Reed's fight scene, where Ben obviously rains yeah. down on and beats him into the ground. He basically agrees to help them. Um, basically, I mean, we have that scene that is meant to, you know, where Ben's like, I blame you, and Reed's like, I'm going to fix it, I'm going to fix it. And there should be some emotional heft there, but these characters and their relationship are so poorly developed. No. There's just not it, the depth of emotion required there isn't enough space given for there to be the uh, there isn't enough space given for ben to be so pissed off because it's just like no well we it there's just nothing to draw from and it's no it's really awkward because it's like hey this is um this is everybody's fault you're you're all in on this. You all decide. The only person who's got legit gripe here is Sue. Sue should be pissed off. Yeah. Because Sue wasn't even invited to this, and she's still got weird powers. Yeah, she tried to solve this. She tried to get... She got you back. If it wasn't for Sue, you'd have been like Victor and fallen into the green goo, ultimately. Yeah, basically, that's... They were all dead if not for Sue, and Sue gets no thanks and instead is just sidelined because Ben's unhappy that he's a rock monster and Johnny's unhappy because Johnny's unhappy. Um, <laughs> yep. The one character, and we see there is such a contrast. To ha- he reacts to being the human torch in the previous films like he's won the lottery. He is ex- Yeah static about it he's so excited and in this it's like well i'm on fire now hey eh? so i gotta you know be kind of a dick to everybody and be a real pissed off that i'm on fire because of all the reasons yeah what reasons tell me johnny please god <laughs> tell me what the what's Share going some on characterization damn it but but then we kind of send a rescue mission. Well, not even a rescue mission. They send a mission of the NASA-approved astronauts to yeah. go and have a gander at this other world, and they rebuild the landing pod type yeah. thing. Yeah, and which... I, but they need they need Reed's help, and Reed's like, you've made it uglier. And it's yeah. like, really, Reed? That's, that's your takeaway from this. Not that they've been, you know, more sensible than you and they've not sent a bunch of drunk astronauts who just want to do it for a laugh. See, one of the things that when he when he says, Oh, you made it ugly and it's it's like, Reed, this this looks better than your your version yeah. of this did. This is like when people talk about like Nirvana demo as being better than the finished products. It's like, no, they sound like yeah. uh, you know, just just a mess and that's maybe you think you're into that but ultimately there's no denying the quality is better when yeah the product has been finished yeah um, it looks more professional it just yeah it, it it's uh, better than what you did is worse yeah um, and yeah he, he fixes all their problems in like 10 minutes by doing some coding <laughs> yeah basically he does typing because typing is science that's so, right and yeah I, I would be okay if he if it was like, ah, oh, Reed does the coding. Where it's like, well, we've been told Sue does the coding and she couldn't fix this. So again, what? Why don't you like Sue? Why is Sue here to solve problems yeah. when you want her to? But ultimately, when she could solve problems, we'll get Reed. I, yeah, it just doesn't flow. There's no. It's like what they know about the characters in one scene, they forget about in the next. 
Yeah, because also, no one's made notes as to who these people are. Yeah, and just because the the landing pod bro- blew up, I don't think Reed's code for the original machine gets erased from the computer in New York City. That's not how computers work. That's not how anything works. <laughs> and anyone who hasn't backed up their work... Frankly, they don't deserve to go back to Planet Zero or the Negative Zone, wherever. If he, if he hasn't saved a couple of times, yeah, it's insane. Um, it's madness. But when we do get to the Negative Zone, oh yeah, with with the actual NASA scientists, who incidentally are far more responsible than. Yeah. You know, they're actually there to take samples and, you know, do science as opposed to just stick a flag in the ground and hope. That's right. And they immediately pick up on a heat signature coming towards them. Oh, I wonder what that could be. Well, funnily enough, Angela, that heat signature is what's left of Victor Von Doom rocking a cloak that can only be described yes. as... Um, and I, I'm I'm gonna hit you with some references in the next like bit of this podcast that are either gonna you're either gonna know what I'm on about or I'm just one maniac here. Okay. So he, he he turns up in his big hooded cloak, yeah, and um, that looks exactly like the big hooded cloak that Gary Oldman has at the end of 1997's Lost in Space when he's been you know left alone too long and become a spider monster. I hadn't made that connection, but unfortunately, that is very true. And what makes this better is, at this point in the film, I thought that and immediately flashed on to, I could be watching Lost in Space right now. I could be having a legitimately okay time. (laughs) Yeah. When when were you reduced to going man i wish i was watching lost in space over this movie that i'm currently watching you know you know things are bad the thing is right lost in space came out at a time where i was like i don't know seven maybe and i loved that film to to its absolute core i everything gary oldman is on fire he's as He's camp very as he good. could possibly be. Um, Matt LeBlanc is in it for some reason. <laughs> See, it's... that's that's what got me. It's like, oh my god, it's Joey from Friends in space. Yeah, and it that's exactly what it is. They don't even try and hide it. And he has <laughs> that cool like armor that like flips yeah! over. It. Yeah, loved it as a kid. And as soon as I oh, and then Gary Oldman becomes a giant spider person. Spider, at the end. yeah, we should mention that. Um, and yes, that uh, ticks all the boxes for me. Um, and that's kind of the version of Doom that they bring back to Earth. They kind of rescue him and he's he's laid out and his suit's been like melted to him. So he's got this like yeah, he, mask he now, type yeah. thing. And, he's basically, and he's made of metal because that's never been done as a Von Doom character before. Oh, that's new. That's definitely original. That's, that's so original. And also, yeah, he has a mouth, but he doesn't speak through the mouth because reasons. It's, that... it's like the grill from the um, oxygen mask has been, like, melded, so his yeah. mouth, it looks like a mouth, but I guess his real mouth is under yeah. that. Yeah, it's, it's a bit like, you know, in that episode of Doctor Who where everyone's faces turn into gas masks. Yeah. It's, it's like that. Um, but on a on a Von Doom level. And he has glowy green bits because obviously the green goo. That's right. Definitely not just because it's an aesthetic choice because Doom. Yeah. <laughs> but then he kind of, they talk about saving him and helping him and, you know, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. And he basically echoes the sentiment from earlier in the film that he doesn't, want to be part of this anymore and he's part of planet zero and that's yeah. his home. he wants to go back and he's gonna go back and he's taking earth with him and earth, earth is you know over and planet zero is where mm. it's at which the whole like this is my second reference that's not gonna catch i can tell go on. so the whole like 
deformed burn kind of metal welded to him and his obsession with like no there is no hope all that's left is this yeah. is is earth is planet zero and that's where i'm gonna go and that's where yeah. hope should be you shouldn't be trying to save earth immediately put me on another film that i like more than everybody else sunshine Oh, sunshine! And is oh, it Mark that... Strong who plays uh, Pinbacker, who's like the captain of the original mission, who's gone he mad is... staring into the sun, and he's all burnt because he's been like, he's not been heat yeah. shielded. He's just been sitting in this room looking into the sun, and he's yeah. like this shadowy burnt figure, and he mm. just doesn't think the Earth should be saved. He thinks people are the problem, and he's gone yeah. nuts. And so it's kind of pinbacker from, <laughs> from Sunshine, Sunshine. Yeah. Dre- like cosplaying as <laughs> end scenes Dr. Zachary Smith from 1997, Lost in Space. In what I what I would like to describe conceptually, not in reality, conceptually yeah. as the best character ever. I think that's what that might have be. I mean, yeah. <laughs> But instead, (laughs) instead, visually, that's what we've got. Yeah. And kind of personality wise, that's kind of what we've got. But the execution is like. Awful. And just nonsensical as well. And she, so he (sighs) clears everything out because he's got superpowers now. He can like do classic doom things, a little bit of energy blast, a little bit of just pushing people around. You know, classic yeah. vague doom powers, and decides to you know rig up the machine yeah. to, to explode and take him back yeah. home to Planet Zero. Well, the the weird thing about all this is, it's like, so why did Victor come back to Earth in the first place? I... Is it a revenge play, or is it like because he didn't know anyone else was gonna come back? And he didn't know when they were going to come back. I mean, for all he knew, they could have come back within, had it not blown up, admittedly, but he doesn't know it's blown up. Yeah. They could have come back within, you know, minutes and, you know, or at least yeah, a few hours and rescued him. So as he has been, he's been like, right, when someone appears, I don't know when that will be. I don't know actually where it'll be because I've got this whole planet to explore. Yeah. And I'm part of it now. But apparently I'm just going to stick around this one little area where I think someone might appear at some point, but I don't know when. And when they do, I'm going to stagger towards them looking like Gary Oldman from Lost in Space. And then they're going to take me back to Earth and clearly they're going to take me to a secret military facility. And then in that secret military facility, they're going to, um, they're still going to have the thing that, you know, the pod thing. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to kill a whole bunch of them. Maybe not as much as Ben though, because Ben's killed 43 people, confirmed kills. Confirmed Um, kills, yeah. So I'm going to kill a whole bunch of them and then I'm going to do that. And then I can use that in order to create like a giant quantum black hole singularity thing and suck all the matter and energy from Earth and build up planet zero and kill Earth, and that will be good. And I'm yeah. like, what? <laughs> yeah, it it means such... It, it, it basically implies that not only has Victor survived because the planet has kept him alive and has somewhat possessed him, but also that he has just forgotten all the science he knows and has just gone utterly bonkers <laughs> and has just decided, like, yeah, destroy Earth, suck it through into Planet Zero, then I'll have all the bonus material from Earth. It's like, what What are you talking about? What? Why would that be a good thing? It's like, what? what? And the whole thing is like, Victor, what? Are you all right, mate? This is... Even for a mad scientist, this isn't even mad science. This is just mad. Mad, yeah. And he, yeah, he. so he bl- basically turns the, gets the machine, projects himself through to the other world and sets up like a stone version with yeah. the classic 2015 oh, yeah. sky beam, baby. Yeah, to, the blue sky beam. To drag a... And all of our dimension, presumably, all into Planet Zero. Yeah. And 
it has this great scene where the Fantastic Four are, well, just, just the four guys at the moment, they're not going to name yet, are like, oh no, we're being pulled in. And Reed literally like just, I don't know, like just, <laughs> it's indescribable the way Reed like is pulled like chest first towards is like, no, no. While everyone else is like, ah, shucks, this again. For some reason, and this is where logic is gone. The the logic, you have lost the logic. You, it, it fell yeah. off the vehicle months ago and you didn't notice. <laughs> and now it's caused irreparable damage. They no longer need oxygen masks no. on, on Planet Zero. No. Johnny can fly through the void. Through dimensions, yeah. While Sue is keeping the others in the invisible force field bubble thing that she yeah. does to keep them she, safe. She, she can fly now, let's not forget. Yeah, because she learns to fly at some point because that's how being invisible works. And force fields? That's how force fields work. Force fields apparently repel gravity now. Who just force, thought? The force field thing has always been a tough thing to understand because she's meant to just turn invisible. But yeah. making that an ability to fly is just nonsense. <laughs> True, so, it is. No, no effort to explain it. Just like, I bet she can fly now. Sure, she can fly, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. And they have this kind of throwdown with Vic on the Planet Zero. Which, yeah. let, let's just clarify, Sue has never been to, and she mm-hmm. takes this incredibly in her stride. She is <laughs> fine with it. Yeah, and no need for environmental suits, guys, yeah. because reasons yeah I, I this is how bad this film is i've made the assumption that they're trying to say well there's a bit of atmosphere now because they're sucking through stuff from earth so maybe yeah. this, i i'm sure that's the the logic in play mm. but god it's nonsense um, it, it's complete <laughs> nonsense this whole scene is nonsense and then like the blue sky beam drags in cars because the one thematic thing that we have used throughout this film is cars so we had like the toy it's like a full circle like the toy cars that reed sent to this damn it it, he thought he sent them to zahara he was using toy cars then and look at the cgi toy cars now coming through (laughs) It's all, it's all a loop. You know, I was desperately trying to find some sort of continuity, and that was literally the only thing I could come up with. Yeah, that, that is <laughs> fair. Um, cars have been a recurring theme. We, for a film yeah. where nobody drives any cars, <laughs> we see cars <laughs> all the damn time. They're in yeah. the, the, the junkyard. junkyard. Johnny, oh, no, we see Johnny drive a Johnny car in his drag car. race. Yeah, and um, he writes car off and that's the sole reason he's brought onto the project because he can build cars yes we even get a joke about the fantastic car it's like they're trying to tell us something (laughs) but i don't know what they're trying to tell us um in their like final fight with doom which doesn't feel like it's the end of anything by the way no they, they kind of throw down and Doom breaks Reed's suit down so Reed like gets all yeah. and yeah. shucks rocks at everybody else as if that's ah yeah. oh, you're on fire rocks sway yeah. down yeah oh, Johnny, you're, you're invisible yeah. rocks. rocks you're made of rocks 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 yeah Johnny crashes and burns that's yes, what I want to put it yeah so but here's the thing so he's basically beaten them. And then magically, Reed has willpower. Somehow? Yeah, I, I guess the idea is that for some reason he didn't deserve the rock treatment, and, yeah. and Reed like wills himself up and yeah. tries to appeal to you know Victor's yeah. sense of where. Yeah, and then Victor's like, "There is no Victor, only Doom." And Which... at that point, Ring the bell, it's done. This is. Yeah. There is no Victor, only Doom. So yeah. good. Thank you. If it, you could have <laughs> released, if, if the entire film was, Victor, don't do this, there is no Victor, <laughs> only Doom. Ah, oh, perfect. Been, 30 seconds that. of excellence in an, an yeah. otherwise car crash. A fantastic car crash. <laughs> of a film. Yeah. Maybe, um, maybe that's where the cars come in. Maybe that is the theme. This is such a car crash of a film. 
<laughs> that we keep having just keep putting cars in it. Let's just. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then Reed, you know, rallies the troops while Doom gets distracted naturally, um, yeah. and, and basically is like, right, well, no one of us is stronger, but together. Let's do this. And so we're just going to go at him individually again, but for some reason right. now it works. Yeah, so they, they just gang up on him, you know, and beat him by turning the thing invisible long enough to just just knock one, get one solid punch in there, knock him into the sky beam, which vaporizes him. Like all good sky beams do. That's right. And then somehow, I guess they just fly back to Earth as the yeah. portal collapses, and yeah, everything's okay. We have a final scene where we're kind of well, hit- you, you say just, everything's just, okay, just, but they oh, yeah. they arrive at the edge oh. of a goddamn massive crater. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I, I, I made a note on this. Let's do it. They arrive at a giant pit in the ground, despite the fact that the Area 57 is meant to be a government facility in the middle of nowhere. There's yep. a pit in the ground, and this triumphant music starts playing, and it's like, <laughs> there's a giant crater. You've just killed one of your best friends, and by the looks of this, thousands of people... Yeah. Are either dead or just dumped into another planet with no oxygen. So, yeah. what's this like? Look at what a great success this was. Let's break out the champagne. <laughs> yeah. More caviar, please. As the triumphant music plays, and they're like looking at this crater, yeah. like, "Good job, guys! High fives! Yeah. Good book. <laughs> hey, Ray. Yeah. Um, well and then, done. yeah. It's madness. It's like you've you've created. A, this is a disaster, guys. Yeah. There is there is there is death. There is destruction. You've basically done the work of a giant asteroid at this point. Yes. Where's where's the goodness in this? Where's where's the why the triumph? It and should be sad. Basically, they then make a deal with the same government body that's been, you know, dead against their existence all along, using them for black ops, that they'll get their own research facility, Central City. Central City, oh my god, yeah, I was like, whoa. Cheeky reference to the 1960s there, for 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 those of you playing along at home, even though we've established that the Baxter Building exists. Yeah, the Baxter Building is a thing, yeah. But no, well, we're making no. a hey guys, Central City. A, a brief a 1960s reference that is no longer the standard home for the four. I'm sorry, it's and just it, hasn't, not. it hasn't been for over 50 years at this that's, point. That's it? right. I'm sure there was reference made to it in like probably Hickman's run or some recent effort, yeah. but no. Um, and then we end the film on this kind of. Oh my god, yeah. Uh, this kind of so like like the first Avengers film ends with Steve and he's all like Avengers, yeah. bam, fades to black and it that's that Avengers Age of Ultron, yeah. Is yeah, it Age of Ultron? Un- it's Age of Ultron that one, yeah. Okay, well, nonetheless, brings up the Avengers logo, yeah. good stuff all around, um, and that's what they try and do here. They they do this thing where they talk yeah. and it's like we need a name, and they yeah. they're like. I can't remember what names and, and, the, and there's four of us. That's it, uh, and and we're a team. And there's four of us, so we need a name, is what Reed says. And and they make some dumb suggestions, and then Ben says, "Yeah, look at us. It's fantastic." And Reed's all like, "Say that again. <laughs> it's fantastic." It's like, what about bam? Fantastic four. Yeah. And, <sighs> End of the film. The problem here is, just imagine a film that kills off Doom in his first appearance. Yeah. Refuses to call it the negative zone. Yeah. He shoehorns in Central City when the Baxter Building exists just to make an, an Easter egg reference to one of the few things they've got permission to use. And... Literally has no sequel bait. 
There's no post credit yeah. scene. This is the only superhero film I can think of from, like, the last 10 years that yeah. hasn't been cocky confident that there's going to be a sequel. I mean, heck, even Rise of the Silver Surfer had a post credits moment with the the no, yeah, with the surfboard. Yeah. So this is so like disinterested. It's it's so aware that like we're not getting a sequel. You're not getting another one of these. We don't need to plant the Easter eggs, sow the seeds. We don't even need to make Harvey like Mole Man esque because you're not getting that film. We're not yeah. making. It. It's never going to happen. And the whole vibe of, like, we can kill Doom because there's no sequel. And they killed Doom in 2005 and he comes back in 2007. Yeah. And it's okay, it works. But in this, he's literally vaporized by a beam of light, man. I mean, didn't didn't stop Red Skulls. (laughs) True, 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 true. Um, Well, I mean, he, he was on this planet and ended up in another dimension essentially that's what happened to him yeah. and victor was already in the dimension when he got vaporized so maybe i don't know maybe that's maybe that's, that's what gonna, i can say i don't know yeah <laughs> but i just we've gone very long on this podcast and i appreciate that that was an yeah. but I, I just think we need to just sum up that there are little glimpses of possibility mm. throughout this film. As as we covered. Tiny you, ones. Yeah. Yeah. That it is a good cast. It is yep. a good cast with given nothing to do. And there is a brief glimpse, and this is what I, I said I was going to come back to, with the like body horror stuff. When Reed's all like warped from being Mr. Fantastic. When Ben is yep. rocked, when when they're all suffering from these initial powers in this government facility, there is a brief glimpse where if you framed this differently, you could have like a weird body horror Fantastic Four film. Yeah. That could probably have worked if you'd like gone for the like more twisted, like they've gone to this other cosmic plane and it's, it's really done a number on them and now they're like recovering from that and yeah there's possibilities there there's there's and sure okay you don't get the epic showdown at the end and maybe the film isn't quite as superhero as they decide to make it before the final curtain but there's a little there's enough possibility to have clawed this back yeah it feels (laughs) however they didn't it feels like that is the reason they hired Josh Trank to start with, because, as we all know, Chronicle. Um, and it's like they wanted the Chronicle version of the Fantastic Four, but they didn't want the Chronicle version of the Fantastic Four. Like, they, they let him have some creativity, but then they were like, oh, don't like where this is going, this, oh, oh, and they pulled back, and then they overcompensated and ended up with this. Yeah, I think there's... You can see how much hesitation there is in every idea. And it... Whilst we've walked away from two Fantastic Four films kind of having some positives to say, and... Yeah. I... I just feel really weird about this film. I... I feel like... When we recommended the Fantastic... When we... I say recommended. When we watched <laughs> Fantastic Four 2005 and Rise of the Silver Surfer, yeah. we kind of came away from it saying, it's worth the watch. It's fun. Yeah. You're going to have a good time. Maybe you're going to see yeah. a different reality where, you know, the Fantastic Four were this dominant franchise and what could have been. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're not going to get that here. This is like... Awful. This is hard. It's yeah. It's it's one of those ones where you I mean the pacing is awful. The characters aren't allowed to be characters. The relation there is nothing here. You can't even say it's pretty because it isn't. The cinematography's terrible because everything's so dark. <laughs> there is no- <laughs> To take a line from um Miles Teller on this one as Reed Richards. You made it ugly. I Yeah. <laughs> 
that's <laughs> that's where yeah. we're at. This is a ugly film that feels like it's bordering on like one of the innumerous young adult dystopian mm. adaptations we've seen. And I don't mean that as an insult. That if that's what this was, aesthetically it nails it. I mean, it's too dark yeah. and there's no real hook. Um, yeah. The hook should be that it's the Fantastic Four, one of the most long-running and celebrated cartoon cartoons, there's comic books, comic. cartoons, movie franchises, ideas, concepts yeah. that Marvel's first family and they've never yeah. felt like less of a family. No. And I'm not sure who to lay the blame at. I think I don't think Josh Trank is a good choice for found family as a general rule, but maybe I'm wrong. But he's certainly there for the horror and the darkness. Simon Kinberg, though. Now, here's a man. I'm laying a lot of blame at that man's door. He's involved in the X-Men films, which, let's be honest, they're hit and miss. Yeah, it's it's an inconsistent kind of world. It's, it's inconsistent. He's also been involved in some Star Wars stuff yeah. as well, which is where I know him from primarily. He was an executive producer on Star Wars Rebels, which mm. is very much found family trope to the point where sometimes you're like, D- guys, dial it back. You don't have to literally, you know, make it clear that that's what you're going for. You don't have to be so obvious about it because <laughs> You know, I love that show to bits, but dear God, sometimes I'm like, no, dial it back. So there is found family tropes. So Simon Kinberg has executive produced a television show specifically based upon the found family trope. Mm. Where were you in this, Mr. Kinberg? Because apparently you rewrote at least a third of it. Told everybody did. (laughs) Pretty much. He and, if yeah. 40 pages of additional material you and hutch parker the other executive producer shot um why 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 did you drop the ball on that because clearly you have been involved in i mean the x-men at times there's the found family trope there that works in some of those films not all of them but some of them you know how this works and yet you seem to not have any sort of ability to make it work hmm so I'm putting a lot of blame on him. Hutch Parker I know very little about, but I don't put all of the blame for the failure, and it is a failure because it only made $167 million on a $155 million budget. I don't put all the failure on Josh Trank. I think he is culpable for some of it, but I think also it feels like every single level, the executives, the writers, the producers, nobody comes out of this looking good. No, 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 no. It's, it's hard to know who should be, like, praised here and who should be, like, criticised. It's hard to know what anyone was planning or thinking or anything. It's, it's there was nuts, no planning, it? no thinking. It's it's a film that seems to be stitched together from several different films, and none of them were good. Yeah, and like I've said, there, there are glimpses of things I could get into with this. I just don't think they commit or run with them. And what, what really stresses me out is if you go to IMDb, and I don't know how legit any of this stuff is, obviously, because basically anyone can upload to IMDb if you try hard yeah. enough. But there's concepts are for... Moloid monsters yeah. and for Annihilus and it, it's all like no you were going to go to the negative zone and include Annihilus that makes sense that makes perfect sense, makes sense. and, and Vix of Doom can still become you know uh, Gary Oldman in a cape whatever he can still become yeah. the villain you want him to be in the future you can in- introduce um harvey and maybe yeah he ends up with these like moloid things that come across from the other dimension and there's so many options it it, i hate to say it but i don't know how marvel can do anything but succeed with their fantastic four film that's coming in the next 10 years um i mean oh it's coming soon it's definitely coming soon because at the end of whatever phase we're on right now i've lost track yeah yeah 
So they did. A, Are we actually re- phase four? Is this? I phase think we're four phase now? four. Yeah, I believe officially we're phase four. So they dropped that trailer montage of everything that's coming. Yeah. So we're having um, the Eternals and Shang Chi. That's it. I always want to call him Shanghai. I don't know why. I feel really bad about that. But we're getting him. We're getting the Eternals. We're getting a Black Widow film, all the rest of it. And then at the very end of that trailer, there is a number four. It brings up a four. And you're like, yeah, you've got plans, haven't you, Marvel? Fantastic four plans. I don't think they can do any worse than this. It's difficult to see them doing worse Mm. than this. It, it's I, a it's a low bar. The bar a, has never been this low. <laughs> no, for any superhero film, it's. I mean, the bar is in the negative zone. Let's be honest. So it's like you can't do any worse. At the same time, I don't understand how is it so hard to make a film about the Fantastic Four, Marvel's first family. The, the the thing that got them so noticed in the 60s. I mean, let's be honest, Fantastic Four was the point that Marvel got into the superhero game properly. Yeah. Why? Why is it so hard to make a Fantastic Four film? I, I'm hopeful that Marvel will do a good job. The bar is 2005. <laughs> yeah, and... Go for it, guys. We have a lot more love for that film than most people do, but this is like the fact that I hear people complain about Rise of the Silver Surfer more than this just just shows how many people didn't go and see this. Yeah, it it does feel like it's cool to dunk on the the 2005-2007 films because, you know, I think part of the reason is we don't have we didn't have the internet as ubiquitous. I mean, I had yeah. the internet. Oh, yeah. But well, it wasn't, you know, social media hadn't exploded. As someone who was on the internet back then, it was, you know, Yahoo groups and yeah. little forums and stuff. Um, but when this came out, I, t- I remember there was just a general wave of, oh, it's terrible, but it lasted all of five minutes on social media, and then everyone forgot how terrible it was. Yeah, I, I think that's very accurate. And I think, um, I think you run into that problem, don't you, where uh, that... In the comic book community, perhaps it's known that this is a bad film, but the general public managed to just completely ignore its existence. And I think that's true, because when I mentioned to my mum that we were going to rewatch it, she was like, hmm, fant- oh, is that the one with Captain America? I'm like, no, we've watched those. It's not that one. It's the one from 2015. And she was like, is that the one where they met, where they have a black man who, who sets himself on fire? <laughs> Which is essentially the Human Torch. That's all she could remember about, and you know, its very existence was a mystery to her. Bless. I I think it's unfortunately accurate. I think most people either didn't see this or hated it so much they wish they hadn't. We're in the latter camp. Yeah, and like I say, that there's a good film hiding in this, but you would have to. I would imagine extensively reshoot it for another hundred million. Um, yeah. Use up all of your like two D budget and yeah, <laughs> I just I don't know. Um, I hope the next Fantastic Four film we get is better than this. I don't see how it can be any worse because this this is a, a film from disinterest from that first mistake of what do you mean you've got the same article on the wall twice? Yeah. It, it's a clear sign that they're not that bothered about the film they're making. Yeah. Um, It's not, the thing is, is it's not a good Fantastic Four film. It's not a good film at all. Like on any level, it's just not, it's just not good. It's not terrible. I think that's where we need to probably (laughs) call it a day on this. I think everything that can be said has been said. Um, We've yeah. been Zach and Angela. This has been bigger than capes, and we have not proven anything <laughs> this week. But remember that comics yes. can be, can be. Bigger, bigger than, than capes. capes. Yeah, mm. and films can occasionally be good. <laughs>